of you who are participating in this meeting for the first time, this is an opportunity to come together to share knowledge, build our sense of community, and hopefully learn how to better serve our state in the face of this serious and growing hazard of extreme heat. Uh, I think our goal is for each of us to leave here with a new connection, a new idea, a new resource, maybe just one useful nugget uh, that will help us do our individual and collective work uh, better together. And as we'll see in our statistics from the State Health Department here in just a few moments, we have a lot of good work yet to do. Uh, my name is Dave Hondula. I'm on the faculty at Arizona State University, and it's a pleasure to be serving as one of the two moderators for our discussion today, along with my wonderful colleague, Melissa Guardaro. Welcome, Melissa. Melissa will now take us through a few more Slido questions to help get our attention and focus on the meeting topic for today. Take it away, Melissa. Why, thank you, Dave. Uh, we just finished our last Slido poll about the number of days that it, there was an excessive heat warning, and we'll find out the answer to that <clears throat> in Paul's presentation. But you can see the most popular were 100 and 154. Now the second question is, what is your organization doing differently this year to help reverse our increasing trend in heat-related deaths and illnesses? So in order to do this, um, if you've joined a little late, you need to go to slido.com. They'll ask you for a password, and that password is HEAT, all in capital letters. And we're really not looking for a, uh, a giant essay, but just rather a few words about what your organization is doing, because this is a planning meeting and it would be helpful to know what others are doing as well. While folks are taking time to think about their answer, I will note that this meeting is hosted jointly by the Arizona Department of Health Services, which participates in the CDC's Climate Ready Cities and States Initiative the National Weather Service, Phoenix Forecast Office, and ASU, but is really made possible by the participation of everyone on this call. Uh, many of you also are participating in the recently formed Arizona Heat Resilience Work Group, which has been meeting on a regular, although a changing regular schedule over the past year. It was really formed in response to the dual threat of COVID and incoming summer heat uh, last year. And the, the work group has continued to meet uh, bi-weekly or monthly in the off season and will now be in, uh, meeting more frequently. And if you'd like more information on how to join this more regular discussion, uh, please leave information in the chat. We'll certainly be happy to connect you and we'll drop a link in the chat to the webpage for that group. Melissa, it looks like we have some great answers coming in here. We do have some great answers, and I'd like to just continue on what, with what Dave was talking about with our Arizona Heat Preparedness and Resilience Group. There is a sub-working group dealing specifically with cooling centers. And if you are interested in becoming a cooling center but don't know how, or you have a cooling center and want to learn how to be a better cooling center, please join that working group as well. Yeah, so we have a lot of really interesting um, points here, and I see that education and additional education are certainly the most common, common answers. But um, yes, yeah, so I think that maybe we should go on to our, our next and last Slido question. And this is how energized are you feeling right now? Are you ready for a great state heat planning meeting? And one is no energy and 10 is super energized. Okay, Dave, a lot of people seem to be at an eight. We're, uh, we're pretty good. We have to uh, push, push more over to the nine and 10 area. Uh, this, is my, this is much better than I was uh, hoping for a <laughs> Monday morning meeting. This is fantastic. Well, we're great to see all of the energy will watch the bars come in a little bit more. No one's been brave enough to hit that number one yet. Maybe not fully trusting that it is an anonymous poll. Now's the time to get some coffee. Well, we're glad, glad to see all of the energy and we hope in uh, about two and a half hours when we are done, we leave even, even more energized. So as we mentioned, there are many folks who have uh, registered to participate and the numbers keep increasing in terms of uh, who is coming in. And I just wanted to highlight a few examples of the range of participation. Uh, Matt's gonna show a slide here momentarily that has uh, some word clouds. Matt, maybe we can go to the word clouds and then we'll come back and look at the agenda. Uh, these are word clouds made based on the 
organizations that participants said they were affiliated with on the registration form and their uh, their titles with those organizations and just to highlight a few examples to showcase the incredible range of who's here today we have many volunteer groups that are participating we have the triple j's of janet john and james from phoenix's community emergency response team we have a number of school nurses who are on the line including eileen from painted rock academy welcome eileen our colleagues from other states are joining us representation from the california department of transportation city of houston federal reserve bank of san francisco so get your funding requests ready uh, many emergency preparedness coordinators uh, fire departments we have uh, wonderful participation from tribal partners and a, a special thanks to our more than dozen media partners and dozen elected officials or staff members from their offices who are joining us today for the media partners we appreciate your work to amplify the good work that's happening by this group and for our elected officials and members of the staff uh, thanks for the uh, being here both to, to listen and to provide some advice to this group on how we can move forward with our heat work. So what is the plan for today? Let's, uh, Matt, if we could have a look at the agenda, please. We have two major, uh, three major parts to the meeting. The first consists of presentations from uh, Paul and Matt, Paul with the National Weather Service and Matt from our State Health Department. We'll hear a review of uh, what happened in 2020 with respect to the weather and heat and health and look forward. Then we have a series of highlight presentations from all across the state that will showcase exciting things that are happening in the heat world. And then in the final third of the meeting, we'll transition into a panel discussion that hopefully will emerge into more of a full group discussion as we think about the anticipated federal infrastructure investment. And our, our question there is how can we prepare ourselves as the community of people working on heat to be ready to take advantage of and align with this opportunity. Uh, if all goes well, we will end at 1130. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Paul Aniguez from the National Weather Service Phoenix Forecast Office. Uh, Paul, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, Matt. A few more housekeeping details. Uh, we do uh, uh, suggest that the preferred audio is through your computer, but there is phone available. And if you'd like to copy down this uh, number and meeting ID, uh, just in case you have a Wi-Fi disaster on your side, feel free to do so at this time. We are recording this webinar and we'll be sure to get all of the materials available to participants as soon as we are done. And Matt, I think we have one more housekeeping slide. Uh, everyone has been muted, but we do welcome and encourage conversation today, whether it's by opening your mic or using the chat feature. Uh, we have a, a, an army of people who are monitoring the chat to try to ensure that your questions uh, will be answered. And uh, as was done uh, last year, we're gonna do our best, and, and this is really thanks to Matt's team, to provide an answer to every question that emerges either through the registration form, our discussion, or in the chat today. Uh, Matt's team did a wonderful job with that last year, and it was really a great resource for, for all of us. Um, so Matt, thanks to your team for, for doing that. And uh, it is encouragement for all of our participants not to be shy, please bring your questions forward. And with that said, it is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Paul, from the National Weather Service Phoenix Forecast Office. Matt, we can come back to that slide in a bit. Thank you. Uh, Paul has been a foundational element of the Arizona Heat Resilience Work Group. And in some of our assessment activities that we did toward the end of calendar year 2020 that some of you participated in, we asked, what, what were the highlights of the meeting? Why did you keep coming to these meetings over the course of the summer? And I think the number one answer was to hear Paul give the update on the weather. So we're hearing the most popular participant from the Arizona Heat Resilience Work Group and a real expert on all things Arizona weather. Paul, take it away. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we go, Matt, uh, jump right into the next slide here. Uh, last season was certainly our hottest and driest on record across the state. If you look at the chart on the left, that's looking at our average temperature for a heat season. And here I'm going to define it as May through October. 2020 was clearly uh, number one in our historical record, which goes back to 1895. We were also exceedingly dry during this time period. We did not have much of any monsoon activity last year. And that's the green bars on the right. And we had a short little one on the far right side. That was us last season. So very hot and very dry. Uh, next slide, please. Reasons why it was so hot and dry, kind of a, a three prong depending on where you're at. Uh, short term weather fluctuations, certainly part of what was going on last year. Uh, for our Annies, we have the urban heat islands to deal with, which is constantly pushing our temperatures up. 
and there's climate change taking place. Our climate is changing across the Southwest. Uh, next slide, please. So heat was a big story, of course, as it typically is, but even more so last uh, last year, we did have our hottest month on record in Phoenix and Tucson also had its hottest month on record. That was August of 2020. Uh, for the first time ever, the average temperature in Phoenix for a month when you take all the highs and lows and average them out was 99.1 degrees, breaking the previous record set in July of 2020. So uh, very hot. Uh, last season, if you go to the next slide, Matt, we can kind of see how this looked, how this played out month by month across the state. If you draw your eyes really to the red areas, those are the 10th percentile temperatures. So you're in the upper 10% of hottest for those locations by month. This is uh, looking at the average temperature and the black is hottest. So we really started out okay early in the year. Uh, May got pretty, pretty darn warm late May, uh, late April into May. Bit of a respite in June, but then July and then August really, really hit us hard. And with the lack of thunderstorm activity, not much moisture in place, temperatures really soared. And you can see just about the entire state had its hottest uh, August on record. And that heat continued really well into the fall and then started cooling down uh, below normal and down to where we would typically expect until December. Uh, next slide. That translated into a lot of heat warnings. This is how many days. There were heat warnings across the state for different locations. You can see down towards the Tucson area, there were about 30 days. Here in the Phoenix area, there was 48 days. So anyone that said 48 on um, the Slido question, congratulations, you got that right. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see how that kind of played out, at least for Phoenix, uh, in a calendar approach. We did have uh, some of our early heat warnings on record then in late April. Didn't have much going on in June, uh, but then late July and into August. August, the majority of August was actually under a heat warning, as we saw with that. Previous map, it was very hot, and then we had heat warnings extending even into the middle of September. Uh, next slide, please. Some interesting data we were able to look at from ADHS. This is looking at emergency room visits that were heat related across Maricopa County. What percent uh, each day was heat related? And I shaded them based on days that we had heat warnings in red. So you can see that there's a pretty good connection between the days when we had heat warnings and fairly large spikes in those temperatures, but I would certainly point out that the days when there were no heat warnings in effect, those are not zero days. And if you go to the next slide, please, I've actually shaded this here by our heat risk uh, product that we have, which categorizes temperatures into low, moderate, high, and very high heat risk days. So this is one of the primary tools we use to issue our heat warnings to grab those exceptionally hot days. And you do see a connection there with the days that have stars or our heat warnings and they correlate with the high and very high, the red and purple on there. But you still have a lot of the yellow and orange days even where emergency room visits were taking place. And if you average them out on the right side by the heat risk category, you do see a stepwise increase uh, in the categories and the emergency room visits that, or, that are occurring. So this is a really good data set that supports the heat risk framework. And we certainly would encourage you to be using that. And if you go to the next slide, Matt, just a simple example here of how we derive these, these thresholds, the temperature thresholds that we compare the forecast to. So this is just for Phoenix for high temperature. You have the dates along the horizontal axis and then you have temperature in the vertical axis. And you see that there's the low, moderate, and high, the yellow, orange, and red thresholds that we compare the forecast temperatures to to determine what the heat risk category is. You notice in the middle of the season that it actually goes up in this location in Phoenix due to acclimatization that would typically take place. Uh, next slide shows an example of what this would look like in a two-dimensional view for much of Arizona. You have the yellow, uh, orange, and red thresholds, the low, moderate, and high. Uh, low thresholds are generally somewhere in the upper 70s into the 80s for a good chunk of the state. And those high, uh, high thresholds there that you see for the red, a lot of places there are like 110 or a little bit warmer. So, you know, it is pretty high. These are hot locations, but we're trying to grab the hottest of those hot days. And it generally, corresponds to a 95th percentile temperature. And on the next slide, you'll see that we take these thresholds and then compare them to the actual forecast. And then you get the heat risk map that you would see on the right side. Uh, if you go to the next slide, there's the URL for the website where you can actually look at this information live. So I would certainly, certainly recommend uh, to bookmark this website. You can see the information for the next seven days. And again, this is one of the primary tools that we are using to determine when and where we issue our heat warnings. Uh, next slide has an outlook for us looking ahead to the coming uh, part of the heat season. So this is looking at the uh, 
a prediction from the NOAA Climate Prediction Center for the average temperature for June, July, and August, so kind of the heart of our heat season. You'll see that the majority of Arizona is highlighted in a 60% or higher probability. Uh, the price chart on the left kind of breaks that down. A uh, very small chance that we are in what, the lower third of the historical distribution, so just a 6% chance we'd have a below normal summer. Uh, I would point out that it has been decades that essentially since Arizona or Phoenix has had a below normal summer, I would personally would probably shrink the 6% down even more. Uh, the high, the above normal is very likely to occur. Uh, next slide shows perhaps uh, something to look forward to. Uh, we are looking at precipitation for July, August, September. There's a slight tilt in the odds towards wetter than usual conditions for the upcoming monsoon season. You've seen the pie chart. It's not uh, as drastically different as what we see in the temperatures, but it is a slight shift towards perhaps a wetter than usual monsoon. Uh, some signals and the tools that we see out there indicating that there is this potential. I would certainly point out that uh, with any summer thunderstorm activity that occurs that can bring about the high winds that are associated with the thunderstorms, the downbursts, and that can cause power outages, which of course can negate our abilities to uh, protect ourselves against heat if we don't have air conditioning. Uh, next slide. So just kind of a quick review of where we were last year. Um, at least one way to monitor, everyone kind of seems to latch on to the psychological uh, aspect of the 100 degree days. We did have a record number of 100 degree days in Phoenix with 145 last year, which uh, ousted 1989 as number one, which had 143. Uh, and kind of looking at this and where we might go in the future, if you look at the next slide, please. These are looking at, if you draw your eye towards the red dots, these are historical observations for Phoenix, the number of 100 degree days that have occurred by year, and you see the clear upward trend that's been taking place. The pink bars is the average by decade. And if you look at the gray and black bars off to the right, this is climate, uh, climate model projections for the Phoenix area in the next several decades of how many such days we could be looking at. Uh, and just eyeballing it, and you see the 145 days that we had last season, potential based on how things play out that what we experienced last summer could be common in just a few decades. Uh, if you go to the next slide, same information except for the 110 degree days, we had a, a very large, uh, very clear record last year with 53 days of 110 clear upward trend in that. And again, just a couple of dec decades from now, what we saw last year could be commonplace uh, coming up. So my final slide to summarize here, uh, 2020 was Arizona's hottest and driest heat season on record. Many impacts, which will be discussed by speakers following myself. Uh, we certainly expect that 2021 will also be hot as it usually is and continue the upward trend that we've seen for several decades and impacts will likely follow with that. We strongly encourage you to use our website to get uh, information with forecasts and heat risk information. And a small little plug I have in there as well, we will be launching a new heat page on our NWS Phoenix website coming up here by the end of the month. And if you're ever uh, wanting to interact with the Weather Service Office uh, to assist in your uh, ability to handle heat, uh, need data requests, anything that we can do from the weather side to help out, please by all means reach out to us. Thank you. Paul, thank you. Wonderful presentation as always. Uh, for all of our participants, we do have some time for questions for Paul. So if you have one or two, uh, please send them in in the chat or welcome to open up your microphone as well, although probably easier to manage uh, through the chat. Uh, Paul, while we wait to see if there are any questions for you, uh, thinking back to some conversations we've heard over the past few weeks, there have been some rumors circulating about changes coming to the types of products that the Weather Service will issue. There's a, uh, some folks in the community are aware there's a federal process that might result in, in new products or changing the name of products. Can you give us a little insight on what's happening there at the, the federal level? Uh, sure. So the National Weather Service, are official alerts that we issue, there's a tiered approach to it. The highest are the warnings, and then below that are what are called advisories. Uh, there's a myriad of, of weather alerts that we issue somewhere on the order of 140, I believe. And so the agency is undergoing a process to try to simplify the number of alerts. Uh, what will probably be happening, all the advisory level type uh, alerts will be lumped together into a single thing called a statement. And then they will, in the headline, will explain what the statement is about uh, elevated wind conditions, elevated temperatures, whatnot. So 
a simplification process really, but not that the alerts are going away by any means whatsoever. And the, the warning level products are, you know, when we issue a weather, when we issue a warning that's indicating that there are life threatening uh, circumstances at play, and those certainly are not going to be going anywhere. So it's a, a simplification process and try to make it easier for our customers to, to use our products. And this is something that is a couple of years down the road we're talking about, probably about two to four years. Great. Thanks, Paul. And uh, on, on that note, could you just clarify, I mean, we have participation, a lot of participation from Arizona, but certainly beyond. Which of those products do we use in Arizona? Are we on the lookout for heat warnings and advisories or one or the other? How, how does that work from your office? For many locations in Arizona, lower elevation uh, communities that are typically quite hot through the course of the year, we the Weather Service does not issue a heat advisory product for those locations because it would essentially, if we did one for Phoenix, we would issue it in May and it would end in October. So there's not really a lot of utility in doing something like that. That's why we solely issue the higher level heat warning product. But higher elevation communities across the state, um, like Flagstaff, for example, they will get the heat advisory product if the conditions warrant issues. Great, thanks. We have a question in from James in the chat. Thank you, James. James asks uh, that you mentioned, Paul, it's expected that we'll have higher than normal precipitation, but we usually see cooler weather with the rain. But then you also said it's expected to be hot. Or hotter than that. So right. how, how do we resolve these possible inconsistencies? Uh, well, one, one aspect from the climate outlooks that NOAA issues is that the temperature trends are so strong, especially in the southwest through the course of the year, that it's becoming very difficult to fall below the thresholds of what defines uh, normal. So there's that aspect in play. Uh, and even if we get slightly above uh, precipitation, yes, there certainly has the potential for cooling us on, on some days with increased cloud cover and the leftover cooler air from, from thunderstorms, but it's not expected to be drastic enough. And again, those shifts in probabilities are not, were not super high. Um, that we're by, we're by no means saying that this is going to be like the most active monsoon ever or anything like that, but um, overall temperature trends are going to tend to wash out any of those effects that you're asking about. Thank you. And uh, one more question that I see has come in. Uh, you, you mentioned how early our, or you showed how early the heat warnings were last year. Uh, what, can you, what can you say about the odds that we'll see that type of extreme heat so early again this year? And I suppose that would be, you know, last year we hit the warning button, I think nine or 10 days from now. Uh, so uh, anything like that in the, on the horizon? Yeah, I believe it was about April 28th or so that we um, issued the first warning last year. Just looking at the information right now, uh, you know, we still are looking like warm up potential in the next week or two, but not any, not necessarily indication right now we will get as hot as we were seeing uh, last year. So perhaps a little bit of an easier transition into the heat season right now. At least that's what the forecast looks like for the next uh, one to two weeks. Thanks. Uh, Paige, I do see your question. And Paul, if I could invite you to respond to Paige in the chat, just so we can stay on schedule and move into to Matt's presentation. Paige, the answer to your question is uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, and I want to be sure Paul gets it right. So he'll, he'll get an answer uh, out to the group in the chat. And let's please continue the conversation related to weather service products. Gail, we also see your question about the number for phone access. We will get that in there right away. Uh, and as we do so, I'm happy to transition us over to next here from uh, Matt Roach. Matt is the Climate and Health Program Manager and the Epidemiology Program Manager and indeed many program managers at the Arizona Department of Health Services. And uh, Matt leads our engagement with the CDC's Climate Ready Cities and States Initiative and uh, really has the, the best statewide uh, perspective on what's happening when it comes to heat health. And he's going to share with us a little bit about what the data are showing from 2020, which unfortunately is not too encouraging. But Matt, we're thankful for your time uh, and being here. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, and thank you all for attending this webinar today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the 2020 impacts for heat illness and deaths. So our preliminary 2020 data, uh, we have finalized our vital records data for 2020. And there has been a historical record 520 heat-related deaths in Arizona, which has far surpassed our previous amounts um, for the past times that we've been recording, looking at doing heat death surveillance. We also had a historical record 893 
heat related illness, inpatient admissions, or hospitalizations where a patient stays more than 24 hours in a hospital. So the data that we have for the hospital discharge data, uh, for the caveats, it is all Arizona licensed hospitals, but we don't have information on patients located on tribal land, uh, Department of Defense, Indian Health Service, and VA hospitals. So there's an undercount of the value that I mentioned earlier, but it still exceeds everything that we've previously done. In terms of heat-related illness emergency department visits and hospitalizations, we saw 2,414 total ED visits, 15 of them were COVID-19 associated as a comorbidity. 70% were male, 45% for young adults 20 to 44, 63% for white non-Hispanic with 24% being Hispanic. And looking at some comorbidities, 29% had a mental health disorder and 17% noted circulatory disease. Looking at our hospitalizations, there were 893 of them with 33 that were COVID-19 associated, 80% male, 40% were middle-aged adults 45 to 64 years old. So you can note the stark difference in the age groups where there's a younger age group going into the emergency department visits, but those more serious cases are hospitalizations. 66% are white non-Hispanic with 18% being Hispanic, and there's a higher percentage of comorbidities in our hospitalized group with 49% having mental health disorder, 32% having circulatory disease with a median length of stay of three days. So here you can see some interesting trends from 2019 and 2020. So heat-related illness emergency department visits decreased, but hospitalizations increased in 2020. So we can hypothesize that people were less likely uh, to go to the emergency department, but waited, and then when it was more severe, for that inpatient hospitalization stay. Additionally, we believe that this may have also contributed to the larger number of deaths. So here you can see those in numbers in the past few years that uh, we've had almost 3,000 heat-related illness emergency department visits for Arizona residents. So this is just Arizona residents, not non-residents. Um, but the hospitalization numbers has gone up. So here you can see those numbers uh, year by year where we had uh, the 3,000 emergency room visits and then the change in care for uh, seeking care uh, has gone down in 2020. But you saw that increase in hospitalization. Looking at the information by county, heat-related illness emergency department visits and hospitalizations occurred mostly frequently in Maricopa, Pima, Pinal, Mojave, and Yuma counties in 2020 with the most amount of cases for, for both ED visits and hospitalizations occurring in Maricopa County. When listed, the activity prior that the person was doing was usually recreational or occupational. But most of the time, what we found in the uh, hospitalization records, uh, most of the time it was not listed. In terms of place of injury, the most were listed as private residence, street or highway, or an industrial site when listed in 2020. So the data is very vague, so we can't determine from street or highway if that was a person that was homeless, or maybe that person was hiking or working outside on a street or highway, but you have to take that with a grain of salt for what it is. Drug use associated with heat-related illness remained the same for emergency department visits, about 21%, and it increased for hospitalizations, 42% in 2020 of all the cases that we were analyzing. Now we're gonna switch into uh, death records. All events that occur on tribal land are treated the same as non-tribal land. And if the event occurs within the state of Arizona boundary, it is registered as an Arizona event. And in addition, tribal facilities submit events to state vital records. So looking at the heat-related mortality statistics in 2020, there are 520 preliminary heat-related deaths and seven deaths associated with COVID-19 as a comorbidity. 48% were white and 23% were Hispanic and 39% were middle-aged, 45 to 64 years old. Three out of four of these deaths were male and 43% of the heat deaths were associated with substance use and about 65% of these deaths occurred outdoors by using a keyword search in the de death record. So as you saw from the previous summary, most heat deaths in 2020 occurred in white non-Hispanics and Hispanic groups with 48% of the deaths being white non-Hispanic. In terms of where they're located in the state, the most amount of deaths occurred in Maricopa, Mojave, Pima, Yuma, and Pinal counties. So here, I think this graph really shows the changes over year well. The heat-related deaths continue to follow an increasing trend in Arizona in 2020, where you can see that in 2019, 2018, 2017, we haven't really crossed that 300 death mark. And in 2020, we surpassed 500, which is unfortunate. Drug use associated with heat-related deaths continues 
and on an increasing trend in 2020. Here you can see that through the use of the green line as a percentage of substance abuse listed on the death records. But you can see with the purple line and the red line that just alcohol use, that hasn't really changed over the years. Most heat deaths had other specified listed as a place of injury in 2020, so it's hard to identify the best location information, whether they were uh, indoors or outdoors, or the, was the air conditioning broken, so this is something that needs further improvement. We can't tell if they were indoors and the air conditioning was off, but we were able to do a keyword search and specify indoor deaths versus outdoor deaths. And what we found is that majority, 65% of the heat-related deaths occurred outdoors in 2020. So if we looked at it in terms of an economic impact, the values that you see here for the hospitalizations and ED visits are the total charges in the billing records that the state gets from hospitals. And so from 2011 to 2020, there are $161 million in charges for heat-related illness emergency department visits and $386 million in hospitalization charges. We used a EPA formula to look at the value of statistical life, which they value at around $9.2 million for contributions to society. And if we multiply that by the number of deaths that have occurred over the last decade from 2011 to 2020, we see an estimated economic impact of $21.7 billion. So where you can find more information about a lot of the statistics that I just mentioned, you can go to azdhs.gov forward slash EPHT. EPHD stands for Environmental Public Health Tracking Data Program. And so in April of this year, a few days ago, we updated this data explorer, which you see a picture of what this graphing tool looks like. Heat related illness ED visits in 2020, heat related illness hospitalizations in 2020, and heat related illness and deaths from 2018 to 2020. Sometimes we have to aggregate years so that when we protect patient privacy, that we don't have a blank map to share with you. We also have information at the sub-county scales, looking at Arizona residents for 2020 for both ED visits and hospitalizations, and also well, 2015 to 2019 for deaths. So here you can see an example of one of the indicators. So this is the heat emergency department visits for Arizona residents. And here you can see the information by county. So in this data explorer, it's interactive. You can see it as a graph, chart, and a table. And the darker color represents the higher number of cases. You can also look at information by rates. Uh, there are many breakdowns. You can look at data by month, age group, et cetera, look at trends over time. But here you can see what was reflected in those tables earlier, the red color with Maricopa County having the most amount of cases. Here we can see the breakdown by hospitalizations. Notice the hash marks which represent, uh, we had to suppress the data because there were not many cases in those areas. But again, most of these were in Maricopa County and Pima County for hospitalizations. Looking at heat-related deaths uh, from 2018 to 2020, here you can see the majority of those were uh, in the southwestern part of the state, including Maricopa County and Mojave County. And here's what our sub-county information looks like. The Arizona Department of Health Services came up with 126 community areas that have broken up the state that use the name of the place that people are usually familiar with. So here you can see in that sub-community information, when we break that down, where are the top communities within the state that are ex uh, experiencing higher amounts of heat-related illness. So it's sorted. Here you can see that Bullhead City, uh, North Mountain Village, Maryvale, Yuma, Mesa, Tempe all had higher numbers of cases, emergency department visits in 2020. In terms of hospitalizations at the sub-county scale, you can see Central City Village, whereas near downtown Phoenix, uh, Alhambra Village, North Mountain Village, and Mesa were some of those higher areas that were affected. So again, azdhs.gov slash ephd, I saw that in the chat if you wanted to go explore this data on your own. Here you can see the death information from 2015 to 2019. We're still working on the 2020 information, but you can see where the larger number of deaths occurred, including Bullhead City, Alhambra Village, the Central City Village, Glendale, North Mountain Village, South Mountain Village, and Guadalupe were some of the higher parts of the state. So this granular, ever, granular level information is very helpful for community level interventions, and that will help to identify priorities, whether issues are happening. And the heat is not the only topic within this data explorer. You can explore more than 400 different indicators, both environmental and health outcome data sets. Some initiatives that are going on, including our emails, 
uh, and text message alerts that we receive the National Weather Service alerts and add public health safety messaging. We have a listserv for schools and a listserv for the general public. And you can sign up at azdhs.gov heat. We have more than, I believe, 15,000 people signed up for our general public list and about 5,000 people signed up for our school list. And you can use this information to provide to, say, school administrators on identifying if you want to keep kids indoors during recess or some outdoor activities, but also just general safety messages to keep yourself safe from the heat during the summer. Um, May 10th to May 14th of this year, we are going to continue our partnership with National Weather Service for a Heat Awareness Week. So you can see from the department and many other partners, we're going to try to promote social media messages at the beginning of the heat season so that we can remind people that this is still an issue in our state. Even if you're a long-term season resident, um, it's good to remind yourself of heat-related illness prevention strategies. Again, thank you for the time to listen about heat-related illness in Arizona. I know that we have a few questions in the chat, and maybe Dave, you can help walk me through some of yeah, those questions. Absolutely, Matt. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, yeah, I think your slides are really motivating that even though there's a lot more, it feels to me like there's more work happening on heat in Arizona than ever before. We're also seeing those graphs moving in the wrong direction. So hopefully we all take that as some, uh, some motivation. Yes, we do have a lot of questions for you, Matt, and I know we won't get to them all here. Uh, let's start with one that I think has a pretty straightforward answer. Is the increase in deaths and hospitalizations that we've observed due in any way to better monitoring and tracking over the last 10 years? So I would say that in terms of heat-related deaths, we haven't really changed our tracking methods. So it's the same international classification of disease code. So a doctor's diagnosis code use ICD-10, and that hasn't changed for deaths. In 2015, the hospitalizations, though, changed from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So those codes may have impacted in that change uh, a difference in the number of cases that were reporting. But overall, I would say that uh, not that many things have changed, and we have a good sufficient amount of data after 2015 to see that this is an impact in our population. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, another question that I think might be somewhat straightforward. You showed some cost and charge information. Well, how did how does insurance factor into those numbers that we saw? Are those before insurance negotiations? After what? What can you share with us about that? So those numbers are before insurance negotiated rates. So the value could be uh, less than that amount that you've seen. Great, thank you. All right, now we'll get into some juicier questions for you. Uh, first question, uh, we have a few questions on this idea. There was a little bit of surprise that there was less emergency department visits in 2020. And there were a few questions around the idea that maybe folks were discouraged or afraid from seeking medical care because of the pandemic. Does your office have any insights into the extent that might be true? And if not, how could we learn about that? So I think more research is needed in this area, but I think on a national scale, what we saw was a delay in healthcare seeking behavior during the pandemic, which I think uh, led to people going in at a more severe time. So I can't 100% um, answer that question. I just think more information is needed. I can only hypothesize on that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and yeah, it feels like there is a, yeah, a lot, lot of work to do to answer that question and an important one. Okay, we have a, a few questions related to substance abuse. And I'll just ask the question as it was read in the chat and uh, maybe the person asking this question can, can elaborate in the chat or maybe we'll have more discussion offline. Question was, please explain why associated with substance abuse is relevant or informative in interpreting the, the health statistics. So that question could be in terms of both the cognitive ability to recognize whether it's safe to do something outside and in terms of hydration as well. So if someone is trying to hydrate with an alcoholic substance, that is not going to properly hydrate your body and be able to thermoregulate. So I think that is something that is important for alcohol. In terms of drug use, 
I think if there are issues regarding cognitive ability um, that way in terms of recognition, whether it's safe to do a certain activities, uh, we also know that there are pres prescription medications that can inhibit the body through thermoregulation that people can talk with their doctor about. So those are just a few insights into that question. Great. Thanks, Matt. And we'll get one more uh, here. And sorry if we haven't got to all of the questions. I see there are a couple more still coming in. And a reminder that we will make answers to the questions available as best we can uh, shortly after the meeting. Matt, what can you share with us about the combined effects of heat and air pollution in Arizona? A lot of people are concerned about summer air pollution in, in particular. How how do we know about how how do how much do we know about the extent to which air pollution is influencing the statistics that you showed us? So I, I think that's a, that's a complicated question, but what we can say is that with air pollution, maybe people are more likely to change their behaviors. Thinking about community design, people may less likely want to do active transportation. Uh, they may want to change activities indoors. So from that aspect, uh, you may be thinking that people could ha be traveling by a vehicle and also uh, I'll have a more sedentary life because they might reduce that kind of that active transportation that were there. But overall, in terms of how, say, ozone or particulate matter impact heat. Um, I, I think more research is needed in that area, but uh, we know that some factors regarding different emissions can be an impact on heat. And so that could be a contributing factor along with the urban heat island effect with the concrete trapping heat, which should lead to a higher exposure. So I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, no, I, think, I think it's so interesting about your answer. The thing about the kind of short term immediate effects and the longer term communities design, as you call them, factors, uh, kind of in interesting causal pathways that are quite different that could create some joint effects. And as a brief plug for my ASU colleague, uh, Rachel Braun, who's on the line from ASU's Healthy Urban Environments Initiative, she, she has some forthcoming research on this very topic in the coming, uh, coming months. So stay tuned for that. Matt, thank you again for your presentation. Uh, for those who do not follow the heat health surveillance conversation at the national and international level, Arizona is really at the front of the pack. When there's a working group convened to discuss how to tabulate heat health statistics, Matt is often tasked to participate in or lead that group uh, because of the wonderful program we have here in Arizona. Of course, it's Sad that we need to have such a program in the first place, but the fact that we have it is a, is a great asset for understanding how, how we can tackle the problem. So Matt, thank you again for all the hard work that you and your team do there at ADHS. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand the baton off to my ASU colleague, Melissa Gordaro, uh, who is going to guide us through hearing about some of the solutions to heat challenges in Arizona. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you, and thank you, Matt and Paul, for interesting presentations. We're entering into a lightning round, so to speak, where we're going to have seven different projects highlighted. And this is just a smattering of the projects that are happening across the area. So uh, first off, we will have uh, Jenny Benas talking about uh, cool pavements with the city of Phoenix. Then we will have a mag review of the Heat Relief Network uh, products. Uh, Alicia Jerger is going to take us through what happened with cooling centers in the city of Tempe, and then we'll have a period for question and answer. We have a second session with Trees Matter and uh, Lad Keith talking about the vaccination sites and the heat effects there, and then a presentation about the Urban Heat Leadership Academy and utility disconnections to tie it all together. So starting off, Thank you, Jenny. Jenny is uh, also fact faculty at the School of Sustainability, and I believe there are some City of Phoenix people here for an assist, if you will. Our speakers have been given four minutes, so please put your questions in the chat. Again, we have three speakers to start, and then we'll do a question and answer period. Take it away, Jenny. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this collaborative project between ASU and the City of Phoenix. Um, a lot of you might have heard about the cool pavement project going on in Phoenix. So today my goal is to tell you a little bit about it within four minutes or less. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the Healthy Urban Environments Initiative for also helping support this research and this uh, effort. So some of you might have seen throughout the city of Phoenix, um, some lighter looking gray slash whitish pavement. This is called reflective pavement or often called cool seal, depending on the company that put it on. 
Um, and so this uh, is just a smattering of images from projects and you can see uh, cool seal next to asphalt or just different attributes of the cool seal depending on the time of day. And all streets do need to get sealed at some point, whether it's the darker asphalt seal or this lighter cool seal. Um, and so the city of Phoenix has been um, working this past summer, they uh, pilot tested eight neighborhood sites and one street or parking site in Esteban Park um, with 36 miles of cool seal over these residential roads. So that's the most of any city in the world. And so they were really leading the way on getting this pilot tested, seeing what is the impact at different times of day. Um, and so this is just an example in one neighborhood the area covered in blue shows the area that would have had the cool seal application, whereas the rest of this neighborhood did not. And so we were able to do data collection to compare these two areas. And so I'll give a brief overview of the different types of data we've been collecting or have collected. But our overall question is just what is the impact of cool or highly reflective pavement on urban heat? And we really approach this with a holistic assessment looking throughout the neighborhoods, both over asphalt and, and cool seal, to understand air temperature and surface temperatures. We also have been looking at subsurface temperatures to understand how this impacts heat going into the ground and potentially the lifetime of pavement. We've been uh, doing a long-term assessment of the ref reflectivity of these surfaces. Generally, when they put on, depending on the type and the company, they're about 35 to 38% reflective around there. And so we're trying to look at those long-term trends. Uh, we've been doing mean radiant temperature assessments, or, or we did in three of the neighborhoods last summer with the Marty cart, which many of you are familiar with. Um, and then we've also, we did some surface temperature overflights from a helicopter. This is just one image here where we're able to then get a bigger picture throughout the neighborhoods of what's happening to surface temperature at different times of day. So, uh, oh, and lastly, we have a survey going out very soon to understand people's thoughts and perceptions um, who received cool seal in their neighborhood. And so very preliminary results, we do know that the surface temperatures are significantly cool and cooler and that's the goal, right? We want to reduce the amount of heat being absorbed by these, these pavements. We want to reflect it back up into the atmosphere. And so overall, um, in all of our testing throughout all the days, we saw about negative uh, 3 to negative 16 degrees Fahrenheit cooling of the surface temperature, so what you would touch. Um, the reflection uh, is, is higher in, in the visible and near infrared spectrum as expected. We're seeing differences between neighborhoods, of course, between 26 and 35, and we're looking at that over time and still collecting that data. We see a smaller change for air temperature, um, about 0.44 degrees Fahrenheit in, early, in the early evening is the, the most cooling we've seen so far. There's a lot of reasons for why we might not see too much, a lot related to air mixing and, and different land cover attributes that we're digging into. Um, but that's pretty meaningful when you think about energy use. Um, and water use and human health. And then overall mean radiant temperature looks similar to sidewalk. And so I just want to wrap that piece up by saying there's uh, research ongoing. We're really interested to see what else we can, can, can dig into and find um, and what this means for uh, energy and, and human health. But overall, we do see the surface temperature being cooler. Lastly, I'll wrap it up uh, with just this message on innovations and in heat governance from the city of Phoenix and the mayor and the city manager have included a $2.8 million um, proposal in their budget for next year to create a new office of heat response and mitigation. And you can see that um, uh, that something like cool seal would be a part of that to be testing, but this would be the first office of its kind anywhere in the country. Um, so if anyone wishes to comment on this proposal, there is one final public hearing, which is tomorrow night and it's open to all, um, which you can participate in, participate in by visiting um, the Phoenix um, website uh, slash budget. And with that, I will wrap it up. I want to thank everyone and especially uh, Dr. Ariana Medell, who's my co-PI on this project. You can contact us if you have questions. So we will do the question and answer period for this uh, after the next two presentations. Thank you very much, Jenny. And I think it's important to note with many of these heat projects, it's not just one or two people, but rather it's a collaborative team and it's a collaborative team certainly across organizations as well. Good morning everyone. My name is Alicia Jerger. I am a senior recreation coordinator with the city of Tempe and I oversee the West Side Multi-Gen Center. That means the West Side of Tempe, not the West Side of the Valley. 
And um, about this time last year, we had gone into, uh, you know, we'd closed our facilities. Most employees were working from home. And we, together with multiple departments, recognized that it was getting hot very quickly and there was going to be nowhere for um, members of our communities who needed to cool off. There's going to be nowhere for them to go. So community services, human services, the fire department, um, Braden Kay, who's on this meeting as well with um, sustainability, we got together and identified that this was going to be an issue and what to do about it. So my building was identified um, based on demographics and um, just locations and all of those sort of factors to be open um, as a cooling center. So we have a senior center here and the multi-purpose room was identified um, as a cooling center. So we got together, we identified procedures as far as health screening, which again was new to all of us at this time, you know, having to do temperature checks and what were going to be the questions that we asked folks and identifying sort of all of those things as we were, all of us trying to figure out what was happening, um, presented a lot of, you know, interesting meetings and a lot of what ifs. Uh, so we were able to open May 18th of 2020 and start serving the public uh, with water as well as um, being able to tap into our human services uh, resources through HOPE, which is our homeless outreach program, as well as CARE 7, our crisis response team. So all of us working together, we were able to welcome folks in sometimes uh, with varying issues, health issues, um, not always heat related issues, um, they were really ran the gamut. And so we were able to serve the public at a time when there were no resources really available to them where normally they could just go into the library and hang out and cool off. And that was no longer an option. So uh, we were here and able to reach out and, you know, reach out to the community through um, Care 7, just in the parks, out and about informing folks that there was somewhere for them to go. And uh, we were open for six months to the Day. And really, the only reason we closed was because um, it cooled off. You know, I, I sort of thought to myself, there's no way we'll need a cooling center because we're going to open back up again, I'm sure, in no time. Uh, but we didn't open. We just closed because it was cool enough that um, heat related illnesses um, were going to probably not be a factor anymore. So we were open six months to the day and we were visited over 1,200 times um, by individuals in that window. And so I know that Brayden and myself were sort of involved in getting together to have those discussions again. This year looks a little different because my building will be open to the public on June 1st. The library is currently open right now to very limited services, but those are going to continue to expand. So we're in a little bit different situation this year in the sense that there will be more resources for just simply being able to go inside somewhere and sit down and cool off. So that's exciting. So that's pretty much the overview of our cooling center here. It was an interesting experience. Thank you very much, Alicia. And uh, Alicia and her team did an excellent job of putting together protocols of how to um, follow the CDC guidance for cooling centers, as well as start a cooling center from scratch. I like to call it cooling center in a box. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we will take questions about this uh, after the next presentation. One more call for Brandy Mead. And if not, I am just going to briefly run through uh, the Heat Relief Network. Um, okay, I'm sharing my screen. Um, the Heat Relief Network is operated through Maricopa Association of Governments. And this network is supposed to be the one clearing clearinghouse where all cooling centers should be listed so that the differing organizations like 211 and other service providers can help just locate where a cooling center is. This kickoff actually happened uh, last Thursday, and I understand as of Friday that there were um, 11 cooling centers that had signed up. Now that might not sound like much, but as you just heard from Alicia, other public buildings are starting to open up, and this is just the beginning of the call for cooling centers. So please bookmark this page because at the bottom, we will have a map that actually, once, once, it gets, here, once it gets populated, we will have a map that will show exactly where cooling centers are and where heat refuge locations are as well. One of the most important things that MAG has tried to do along with all of the other providers in the region is to use two phrases. One is a cooling center for an indoor air conditioned location 
And the other one is a hydration station. So for those of us on the call, if you are um, involved in either one of those things, if you can use that common language, that will really help an awful lot. So that you can see here, this is where the map is. And there are hours of operations and contact, uh, contact lists as well. And you can zoom in and out to go and find all of these. This is available in English and in Spanish. And I understand that this year it will also be uh, very easy to find from um, a, a phone. I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute because I need to get back to that page. So if we go into this page, you have a, a sign up sheet for partners. And if you are, were a heat relief um, network member last year, that sign up page is relatively easy because you're just confirming your information. And if not, you would go through the whole, the whole list along the way. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to expand the number of cooling centers. And we have brought in the Arizona Faith Network to try to open up some of those buildings that were closed last summer too, and um, to just make them additional cooling centers uh, along the way. So um, SRP, thank you very much if you're on this call, has helped to offset some of the operating costs that are involved with uh, opening up a cooling center. But then there also became the question, okay, so what are we going to do about some of the things that people need? And this cooling center response network is meant to work hand in glove with the heat relief network. So uh, what this basically is, is a, a decentralized donation network between cooling center providers and donors. And the supplies that are very limited right now because this is a test year. We're collecting water, we're collecting various PPE and various general supplies. And how it works is that a cooling center, we don't, we, this is going to be launched after the heat relief network gets up and running, would list what they want, when they need it, and uh, the address. And then the contributors who are the donors would be listed. This is all very transparent along the way. And um, what I want to point out is the cooling center providers. This checklist here, these agreements are also the agreements for the heat relief network. So uh, your cooling center needs to be located in a public building, not a private residence. Uh, it needs to be open to all who are seeking heat relief and that there's no discriminatory policies and that you operate using CDC guidelines and that you also uh, are advertised through the MAG Heat Relief Network. So we don't want somebody here asking for supplies and then not being able to be discoverable underneath the Heat Relief Network. And pet friendly is something that we went back and forth about. It would be awesome if you were pet friendly, but we wanted to not have a cooling center not open up because their institutional policy did not allow for pets. But understand that people are very hesitant to separate from their pets. Um, and then also we wanted some sort of basic heat health safety training and Red Cross psychological training. That work is uh, underway right now to try to figure out what the best modules are. So um, yes, so why don't we wrap up this part of the, um, the rapid fire questions, uh, the rapid fire presentations. And I'm just wondering if uh, there are any questions in the chat. Yes, Melissa, th thanks for helping uh, jump in there on the first lightning round. We did have a question for our first speaker from Amy, uh, who asked, when we cool surface temperature, does that help with cooler nighttime temperatures in the summer? Yeah, Amy, that's a great question. And what we're finding is that the, so, so we tested at four times a day. And so we went right before sunrise. And the biggest difference in air temperature we were seeing was right after sunset. And so we expect that the, the, the greatest cooling from the cool steel would be in that first nighttime part. Once we, once we got to right before sunrise, we didn't see much of a difference at all, but we do expect that over time, overnight temperature, air temperatures to be uh, lower. And that has a lot to do with that heat being retained in the asphalt and then slowly emitting um, versus the heat and the cool seal is much lower. And so it cools off much faster is already cooler. <laughs> Thanks. And I see there's a question from uh, Dave Saylor about cooling center tables in terms of open hours. So um, the Salvation Army is actually open for a cooling center all the time. However, they are uh, open during heat warning times as a pop-up tent. So like I said, we want to keep a very clear definition that a cooling center is an indoor air conditioned location. A hydration station can be indoors or outdoors, but they give away water. 
So we are encouraging our cooling partners to not just open during heat events because it's kind of hard for the wraparound services that rely on using the map or like 211 to refer people because then they need to check, oh, is today a heat warning? Um, rather, we would like to see regular hours. But the caveat being the Salvation Army that has traditionally done this, and also it's to be noted that they are pet friendly as well. So another question about cool seals for surfaces. Um, the increased reflection in the atmosphere could actually cause some visibility issues. So uh, Jenny and team, would you like to address that? Yeah, sure. And I, I invite uh, Dave or Ari, Dave Saylor or Ari, to jump in on this as well if you have a, a better response. In general, the cool seal that was put on in Phoenix is not, it, it's not like snow reflective, so it doesn't feel as blinding, but at certain times of the day, depending on the sun angle, it might look more reflective and potentially affect someone's view. We, ha we do have a question like this on the survey going out. Um, so we're asking residents who are in these uh, these neighborhoods if they have experienced any issues with visibility at different times of the day. One of the images I showed at the start showed a little bit of reflection when the sun angle was was lower um, in the morning time. So um, you definitely could see that um, and, and we're, we're interested in understanding. Yes, it, it does increase reflection, but but not, it, it doesn't, I mean, if you're out and about, you might see this around and um, you don't notice it too much anymore. It's kind of blending in, you could say. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Sailor, you have anything to add. Just may, maybe just a, a brief comment that, uh, you know, when you're driving in to work in the morning, you drive across a lot of concrete yeah. surfaces, on ramps, off ramps, and you don't even realize it probably. Um, mm -hmm. And these, these surfaces are roughly as reflective as a concrete surface. So I think that's one thing. The other thing is that added reflection actually is beneficial in nighttime because it adds visibility. Mm, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave, because that was actually one of the next questions in the chat as well. So uh, it's nice to know. Just in terms of uh, the normal person, the reflectivity, is this like looking at blinding white pavement or is it like looking at white sand? I wouldn't say either. I would say it's like it's, it's a grayish almost. Um, but but uh, I think too, as a part of the team that was doing data collection over these surfaces, you, you want sunglasses on because it's, it's definitely a bit brighter, right, than the darker asphalt, which is expected the same way as, as Dave was just saying that concrete is to the eyes and more reflective to the eyes. Uh, there was some, thank you. There was another question in the chat about what is to be expected when you walk into a cooling center. So I know that Alicia uh, from the city of Tempe could probably answer that. And also Nicole from the Salvation Army, would you like to answer that question about what to expect when you walk in? Um, I can, uh, I'll go first. So the way we had it set up was we had two, an entrance and an exit to keep, you know, crowds from crossing and staying clear of each other and whatnot as far as COVID protocols were, uh, were concerned. So every morning you would come in, we'd open up and the line would queue and we would take, uh, do the health screening, which was temperature. And then those sort of set of questions about fever, soreness, cough, um, trouble breathing and whatnot. If they had a temperature of over a hundred and a hundred point four, now I'm spacing on what that was, we did allow them to sit and cool off and then retake their temperature. If that was their only symptom, um, if they had multiple symptoms, they weren't permitted in we did have chairs outside and then we would dispatch our care seven crisis response to see if they did need further medical attention that rarely happened it was usually high temp that cooled off once they sat inside um, we did ask demographic questions. It was part of our funding in order to get um, some FEMA funding. We did want to prove that we were serving um, a low income population as a crisis response uh, to the pandemic. So then they were able to sit down, charge their devices. We had charging cables available and then also get water. Um, if we had snacks available, snacks were handed out. And then if they did need to visit with someone from CARE 7 or our homeless outreach program, they were able to do that. A lot of times it was to get their mail, at, inquire about getting a new ID, other sort of government services that would be available to them. So uh, that was a huge benefit that we were able to have folks on site as sort of a one-stop shop, you know, for all of their needs. So thank you. Uh, 
And I have to tell you, I, I went to the Tempe Center. It was a really warm and comforting, well, warm is probably the bad word to use. <laughs> it was cool. It was very inviting. Um, Nicole, do you want to add anything about the Salvation Army site? Sure. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So all of our um, 11 centers are configured a little differently. So what we offer on the inside um, might vary from location to location. Um, of course, we offer everyone um, a, a PPE package when they walk in. You'll get um, hand wipes, gloves, mask, um, anything else that we have available. Um, we had chairs spaced out um, throughout our center so no one's, you know, everyone's six feet apart. Um, some of our centers, we have TVs, they can, you know, watch whatever's going on, um, charge their devices, um, you get snacks, you get water, you know, some of them just have different things going on. If they need services, they can have that. Um, if they need food boxes, they can have that. So it just depends on where you're at in the valley and what they have to offer. Um, but at a minimum, everyone gets PPE and water, and then we have tons of all, you know, different resources that are available. And then, uh, thank you. And then an important note too is that 211 Crisis Response Network is also available for uh, additional services should they need it. And uh, Lyft has contracted with 211. There's some qualifying criteria, but you can get a lift to these cooling centers as well. Okay, let's move on to the next winning round and uh, we'll kick it off with Amy Esposito from Trees Matter and welcome Amy. Hello, hi, well uh, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, my name is Amy Esposito, I'm the executive director of Trees Matter and I um, you know I think it's been really great to be a part of um, and be welcomed and invited by the heat resiliency heat response community because a lot of times we think about the immediate response, but there is that long-term aspect that we want to think about in regards to the cool, cooling. Um, I don't know if I have access to change the slides, Melissa. Do I just let you know and you'll switch them? I am actually, uh, uh, Matt has the slides. Oh, okay. So I'll just say next slide <laughs> when I'm ready. Um, and so our mission is to inspire and promote an increased tree canopy here in the Valley. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, we're a rather small nonprofit. There's um, four of us that are full-time staff. Um, and um, we, we get a lot done with how small we are because of the amazing volunteers we have, but also because we love to collaborate. And I think that's something that um, this, this workshop, all the people that are here today understand really well that there's, you can get a lot more done when you have uh, support with other people. Instead of reinventing the wheel, we can complement each other and, and, and focus on um, being efficient in what we do well. Um, so if we wanna go to the next slide. Um, our, program, our main programs and projects right now, we have our SRP Free Shade Tree Program and um, this year was a really good year for um, trees, the popularity of trees. I think people staying home, um, being more wanting to create uh, a space within their own this year. We upped it to 5,500 and didn't think we would, um, during the pandemic, meet that goal, but we actually gave out 6,000 trees this year. Um, so there's quite a lot of interest and in what we were able to do with that program um, because we moved to a webinar format instead of an in-person workshop due to the pandemic um, is be able to be more accessible to our Spanish speaking communities. So we had a live interpretation in both Spanish and English. Um, we also have our Trees for Schools program where we plant with trees with students. Uh, we worked with Jenny, who was the first uh, presenter in this lightning round on a, a planting this uh, to kick off April, which we call Arbor Month. Trees during the pandemic, we've been working with arborists to plant the trees and do recordings. And we also have an AmeriCorps VISTA that's doing classroom engagement, as well as our biggest focus, not just planting trees, but having that long-term engagement with the schools and with us. So we don't ever just plant trees and leave. We wanna come back and we wanna make sure these trees are successful. Um, and we primarily work with low-income communities. We use the Maricopa County Public Health Department's um, mapping program that they they created for us that has an overlay heat um, related illness and death, uh, vascular disease rates, and then income level to choose, I guess, mulch and, and greenery. There's still the need for that canopy and that shade. And so 
we're working with them to do that. And we're specifically working on like food based trees mostly. So it'll be really exciting to have 100 more trees that are producing shade and food there. Um, and we're also doing um, a, a living memorial with those trees by hanging tags um, of people who've been impacted by COVID-19. This is something we're really exciting, excited to do and really related to what, you know, what we've talked about today. Um, Jana might be on the, on the uh, workshop from uh, the Phoenix Tool Bank or Phoenix Community Tool Bank, but we're both wanting a truck and um, here at Trees Matter, we can do a lot if we have a truck in regards to going to communities. Um, tree planting itself is not difficult, it's the coordination involved. So getting this, the planting supplies together, the mulch, the trees ordered, getting it all together. And so the more that we can bring everything together in a truck, the easier it is. So what this truck would be doing is during the, the planting season, um, we would have the ability to go to communities that need trees the most and help with tree plantings. But during the high heat months, which is when we don't wanna plant trees, the Phoenix Tool Bank, which has a lot of space in their warehouse, um, but also is slow right now during the extreme heat months, um, would have um, the ability to help with um, providing much needed resources to our cooling centers and to um, any any sort of, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of ways that they can be um, supporting um, the, the community in regards to providing um, water and we, we're asking for first machine too and all sorts of things so it's just a great resource that you don't necessarily think about but builds capacity quite a bit so we're really excited about this um, idea of addressing heat year-round in different ways and then a few resources um, that you may be interested in um, are probably our most pop popular that we provide is um, on our on our face Facebook group called ask an arborist we have volunteer arborists that provide tree care advice a lot of times we think about planting trees but when it comes to trees, trees um, succeeding, they're at their greatest value as they get older. So we really need to think about that long-term care. And one of the things that happens to all of us is that something happens to our tree and we don't know what to do, right? And so this just saves, I, I don't have it data on this, but it probably saves a lot of trees that otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to survive. So, um, it's a great free resource. We're really lucky to have the, uh, the arborists that provide that resource. And then we have an advocacy resource page that we're continuing to build. We wanna do more and more with advocacy. Right now we have the County Assessor's um, site on there and talk about the difference between land use and tree access and then a tree database with various trees so people can choose the right tree for them. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, well, we'll hold off on the questions yeah. until, <laughs> until after. Thank you so much, Amy. And if you have any questions uh, about Trees Matter, their truck, or anything like that, please put it in the chat and we'll get to it after these other presentations. Uh, next up is Lad Keith from University of Arizona, who is going to do a presentation about how hot it is in um, the, the giant COVID vaccination sites. Take it away, Lad. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. So my name's Lad Keith. I'm an assistant professor in planning at the University of Arizona. And this project was with my um, colleagues, Nicola Rosalardo, Ida Sammy, and Erica Ostoff. And so uh, what happened here, so I, I normally research uh, urban heat and uh, planning and governance kind of at the larger scale, but uh, Pima County Office of Emergency Management reached out um, as the temperatures are increasing, they were uh, concerned about their heat preparation for their volunteer staff and the clients at um, our outdoor COVID vaccination sites in Pima County. And so what they asked us to do is uh, put together a team to assess heat risk at these uh, three sites. So one at the University of Arizona, one at Banner South Kino, and one at Tucson Medical Center, and really look at kind of the different tasks that those volunteer staff and clients were uh, performing and kind of exposed to heat in different situations. And so the sites are often on large parking lots and um, have operating vehicles which uh, emit and radiate a lot of heat. So kind of some unusual situations that haven't been looked at very closely before. And so um, the idea was that we would go there, do some uh, data collection and then recommend 
uh, operational and site design modifications to increase heat safety. So they contacted us in March, and this is the fastest turnaround for a research project I've ever worked on. If you are involved with university research, you know it can take years to write a single report. So. Uh, we did data collection a couple of weeks after, um, got a rapid grant to help fund uh, equipment and some volunteers, and then got reports out um, within a week of the data collection, so pretty fast turnaround there. You can see in the image that's the Banner South Kino, that's the vaccination site, and uh, just notable that the intake tents are kind of on the left-hand side, vaccination tents are in the middle, and then they have a unique kind of uh, situation where they uh, do the observation areas underneath the solar panels and so that provides some shading and so what we did here was uh, collected uh, data at each of these sites um, from 12 to 5 o'clock um, and we did it once in april and we plan to go back to the sites that are remaining open in may and june if they still remain open at that point and we have uh, six locations at each site and examples are um, tents under the shade tents in the shade with cooling um, on the road with full sun where traffic management's happening and in observation areas in the full sun um, and so we collected ambient air temperature and wet bulb globe temperature readings every 10 seconds and uh, surface temperatures every 30 minutes and then FLIR images kind of as needed and that was interesting. And as you can see here, this is Pima Association of Governments um, publicly accessible urban heat island map and the red block kind of shows where the Bano uh, Kino site is. So although it is surrounded by kind of cooler uh, grass uh, fields, the site itself is on a large parking lot and has a higher heat severity. So that's something that Pima County certainly um, noticed and that's one of the reasons they brought us out. Next slide. And just to share some very preliminary results. And again, this is just looking at that Banner Kino site, although we do have results from the other two sites as well showing that the ambient air temperature readings that we recorded on that day um, did exceed the recorded high for the region of 90 degrees. And of course, as expected, the full sun locations, um, so those volunteers and the staff kind of in the gravel lots directing traffic um, do have higher uh, ambient air temperatures as you would expect. Um, and then notable how the cloud cover um, period that's kind of noted there really did decrease the temperatures for the whole site, um, notably in the afternoon. And this is some of the data readings from our wet bulb globe temperatures. And that is uh, an index used to approximate heat stress for individuals. And kind of interesting here that um, you do see, again, those full sun locations are at much higher heat risk. And again, this was a 90 degree day, but we're, uh, you could use this information to help kind of extrapolate what would happen in hotter uh, temperatures too. So again, the cloud cover is very noticeable there. Um, I think one thing that surprised us a little bit was how well the observation area um, under the solar panels um, performed. So that's the lighter orange line at the very bottom. So that was one of the most thermally comfortable locations on the site. And uh, notable also that there was a break tent that was three-sided um, facing west and how poorly that performed. So um, kind of something you wouldn't necessarily expect, but it had a lack of ventilation and had one of the worst uh, shade ambient air temperatures on the site. <clears throat> Just some uh, thermal images. Uh, again kind of showing what you would expect that the traffic direction um, locations in the full sun in the parking lot are obviously at the highest heat exposure and uh, this is kind of one of the interesting things um, that we looked at at all three sites was the effect of those radiating cars that are operating in those tents and so all those the tents are shaded they do have vehicles that have been sitting in the sun sometimes for over an hour and so kind of what's the effect of those cars that have been um, not only absorbing the heat but then also are mechanically kind of emitting heat through their exhaust too so we looked at that as well and this again is just showing that uh, uh, the solar panels and the shading and that what really was one of the cooler um, locations on the site I'm trying to keep it short here <laughs> so just some successful heat risk um, reduction strategies that we wanted to apply um, the banner south kino operators so they do staff the traffic management, um, which is the highest heat risk task with the climatized workers um, for the most part. And that's something that we saw across all sites, but of course, um, volunteers often are, you know, many of them are elderly. Most of them don't work outside at all and are not acclimatized um, to high heat risk situations and they want to do good. And so kind of they're, they're certainly the most vulnerable folks out there. And that's part of the reason that we were um, asked to come out. Um, Locating the observation area under the well ventilated um, solar panels was a really good adaptation and then they also use the Kino stadium shaded outdoor space for um, their primary food and beverage break area, which was um, we didn't measure it, but it was thermally kind of at the thermal mass of the building was much cooler space than the break tent that we did measure. Next. So just some quick uh, design and operation recommendations. 
Um, so there were uh, not very many open shade tents in the traffic management areas at any of the sites. And so um, that's something certainly that we are encouraging the site operators to consider. Um, are also looking at site design features like reconfiguring the brake tent flaps to be um, uh, movable or at least uh, to face the south and west sides to prevent the sun um, and to eliminate three sided tents, which really do prevent ventilation and um, have some good evidence of that with the brake tent that we were looking at. I'm also recommending adding large fans to the vaccination tents and um, asking no cars idling inside of the intake tents if they're going to be there for like five or 10 minutes sometimes. Um, looking at strategically watering the parking lot for its cooling effect, and they're doing it for dust control in some situations, um, but kind of looking at the, um, at the possibility of watering it for cooling effect too when it gets too hot, making cooling, uh, cool drinking fluids more readily available, um, very importantly, enforcing breaks. And, you know, again, they were doing an adaptive management situation, so many of the breaks were on a voluntary situation or on a, uh, on a system, but kind of our personal observations were most of the volunteers there were really trying to do something good and um, were refusing to take breaks, so I think breaks have to be enforced. And then um, we offered a modified break and shift recommendations for that specific location um, for the volunteers as well. Next slide and wrapping up here. So just wanted to, again, um, thank our community partners, the University of Arizona, um, Pima County, Banner Health, um, and Tucson Medical Center. And again, just shared some of the results from the Banner site. Um, but also want to thank our UA students, staff, and volunteers. And of course, the Office of um, Research, Innovation, and Impact for um, putting together that rapid um, grant for us to do this work. So I'm happy to take questions after the other presentations. Thank you so much, Led. This is something I'm sure everybody who's gone to those giant pod centers has been wondering, like, how hot is this and how much longer can we actually carry on like this? Okay, um, if you have questions for Led, uh, please put them in the chat. And next, we're going to move along to the to Anna Bettis from the Nature Conservancy, who is going to talk about the Urban Heat Leadership Academy. Thanks, Melissa. Hello, everyone. Um, as Melissa said, I'm the Healthy Cities Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy in Arizona. Just quickly, in case you're not familiar with the Nature Conservancy, we are the largest conservation organization in the world, working in all 50 states and 72 countries. So you may be familiar with TNC, uh, with our work to conserve ecologically significant lands, but a number of years ago, we saw that, you know, if we really want to address some of the big environmental challenges that we're facing, we really need to look at cities and how we can bring nature into cities to help solve some of those challenges. And so that touches down differently depending on the local context. And here in Phoenix, as uh, we all are hearing about today, heat is a significant challenge. And so that's one of the areas that we're focused on for the healthy cities work and also air quality. And so we're really looking at specifically in Phoenix how Increasing tree canopy in underserved communities can help improve air quality and mitigate heat for people, nature, and the economy. And you've heard today about uh, heat challenges, and I'm sure I'm a little bit speaking to the <laughs> preaching to the choir here, but just quickly wanted to highlight um, some of the equity challenges because it's relevant to where we're focusing our work with the Urban Heat Leadership Academy. Um, you may be aware that the hottest communities in Greater Phoenix also have the lowest tree canopy and highest child poverty. If you look at the map on the left, that's uh, land surface temperature and those dark red areas have a higher land surface temperature. You can kind of see, I know these are quite small, but I wanted to show them side by side, um, kind of down Glendale and South Phoenix, a bit of an L shape. Um, in the middle, the light green areas have a lower tree canopy cover. And the last one is the, the dark blue have a higher percentage of child poverty. Um, and just to drive the point home further, um, on some days there's neighborhoods in Phoenix as little as two miles apart that have a 13 degree difference in air temperature. So there's just some really significant equity challenges that we're facing here. Uh, but we know that nature can play a role in helping mitigate urban heat. Um, I'm only gonna talk right now about the Urban Heat Leadership Academy that we're working on with our partners. If you're interested in our work more broadly in Phoenix, you can go to nature.org slash healthy cities AZ. I'm going to share a little bit about one of the programs that we're working on with partners called the Urban Heat Leadership Academy. Our core partner for this is Phoenix Revitalization Corporation, and they're playing a really important role in helping us to ensure that the content that's being covered in the academy is culturally accessible and that it's um, you know, appropriate for anyone who, you know, might not have a background in this topic. 
The goal of the Academy is to equip community residents in Phoenix with the knowledge, resources, and skills to mobilize their communities and to advocate for greener, cooler, and healthier neighborhoods. Um, and you can see there's a lot of other logos here. Uh, aside from just us and PRC working on the program, we have a number of different uh, learning partners or content partners, many of which you've already heard from today, um, who are contributing uh, content to help build out the curriculum for the Academy. Uh, and I just want to also mention PRC is also playing a really important role. They have um, trusted relationships in the communities that we are um, looking to do outreach in for this program. Um, the Academy is really for people who live in communities that are disproportionately impacted by heat. So that's really uh, important for us. A little bit more about the Academy. So it's a five month long virtual program and it's going to be launching in late July 2021, offered both in Spanish and each cohort will have room for 30 to 40 participants. Again, I mentioned these are um, people living in communities most impacted by heat in Greater Phoenix. It covers sustainability challenges related to heat, but also the intersection with challenges related to air quality and water. And we're gonna um, also cover um, some of the historical environmental challenge or environmental justice challenges that have kind of contributed to the equity issues we're seeing today and look at how we can address those and kind of change the outcomes that we're seeing. It also covers um, uh, some skills and tools that will be useful to participants when looking to advocate for change such as, you know, how do you do effective advocacy and how do the how do participants tell their stories in a really compelling way. Um, and our idea here is to really develop a cohort of community leaders who are more engaged in the decisions that affect them and uh, really uh, take these neighborhoods that are most impacted by heat and, you know, transform them into greener, healthier, healthier and cooler neighborhoods, like I mentioned on the, the last slide. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about this, or maybe you work with communities disproportionately impacted by heat and you might want to help us get the word out, uh, feel free to email me. Um, if you go to the next slide, my email is on there, anna.bettis at tnc.org. I'll stop there. Or yeah, tnc.org. Okay, I thought I, thought I said that wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Oh, I love that picture. Thank you, Anna. Um, again, if you have questions for Anna, please put them in the chat. And we have one more presenter. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I am. I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll try and keep this brief. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. I just wanted to share a brief update about um, the ongoing situation with the Arizona Corporation Commission. So for those who don't know, the Corporation Commission oversees many of the utilities in Arizona. and is working towards creating a new set of utility disconnection rules. So just to give historical background, as they've been thinking about these rules for a couple of years, ASU, our partners at the National Weather Service, and our partners at several community-based organizations, including Arizona Wildfire, have been involved in the conversation around what a good disconnection policy that prioritizes public health might look like for the Arizona Corporation Commission. Historically speaking, utilities have had their own disconnection moratoriums. Uh, in APS's case, I know they were looking at using National Weather Service uh, heat days, heat warning days, to make sure that they were not disconnecting electricity and utility customers during those days. I believe SRP has been the same historically, although I'm not sure about that. But I think the Corporation Commission wanted to standardize the process especially after some media coverage of an unfortunate death that happened after someone was disconnected from power several years ago. So this is ongoing and in process, but they did just have the first vote that would make these uh, disconnection rules policy for most utilities in Arizona. The way it currently stands is utilities can choose from two different conditions and it's, it's the utility's choice and that's either no shutoffs between June 1st and October 15th. So starting June 1st October 5th, to October 15th, there would be no utility shutoffs for any reason, regardless of the amount owed by customers. Or alternatively, they can choose no shutoffs on days that are forecasted to be uh, uh, over 95 degrees, or sorry, that's a typo, below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So they can choose either of these conditions. Our suspicion is that it's much easier for utilities to plan for calendar dates than it is for temperatures. So we suspect the most used condition will be the one that is no shutoffs between June 1st and October 15th. In addition, there's some adjustments to other rules uh, related to that. So for electrical customers, 
uh, utilities will not be able to shut off their power if they owe $300 or less on their bill. And for gas customers, it's $100 or less. There's also a policy going into effect that one missed payment is permitted without penalty for every 12 month period for each customer. And then the Corporation Commission and the utilities together are looking at implementing additional programs for heat vulnerable people that can assist them and ensure that their power doesn't get to the point of being turned off if it's outside these moratorium conditions. As I mentioned, this is ongoing. With the first vote has been taken, and that's a good sign. It's moving towards becoming official policy. I believe there's at least one more final vote that we can anticipate in a couple of months and one more public comment period uh, between now and then. So if you're interested in being a public commenter or getting involved in that process, I'll go ahead and I'll put my email in the chat and happy to talk about it more and happy to take questions in the chat as well. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liza, and thank you to all the panelists. We have a couple of questions here, and uh, the first question, I guess, is for the cool pavement. Uh, no, actually, this is for, for a lad. Did you look at the combination of heat and humidity with the possibility of cooling pavement using water? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, obviously, we were just out there for one day, and so we didn't have time to do kind of a before and after, although um, if, if that's adopted, we'll certainly um, take a look at that the next time. I think, generally speaking, you'd need quite a lot of water to raise the humidity to the level where it is start to affect thermal comfort, and more what we were saying is they already had the water trucks um, at several of the vaccination sites kind of spraying down for dust control, and so we're going to look it was uh, to it would provide some temporary cooling, but you would need quite a lot to raise the humidity levels that high. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this is for Anna at the Nature Conservancy. There was a question about whether this program was going to be in, in Tucson or other areas, and then also maybe you can briefly state how somebody can be nominated or whether you, you need to apply to become um, a heat a heat leader. All right, thank you, uh, Melissa. So for the time being, we are launching and piloting the program in Greater Phoenix, so it is not in Tucson. Um, the, the Healthy Cities program right now is also just focused on Greater Phoenix. Um, that being said, it being a virtual program, I think, uh, uh, provides some really interesting opportunities for scaling. So uh, we'll see what the future holds and what we learn from this uh, first, first year of launching the program. Um, we are making updates to the application now. I didn't mention in our short time it was going to be an in-person program launching in March of 2020, so we're having to go back and uh, work on some things uh, to, to kind of get it ready to launch again. Um, and so there will be a link to the application on the Healthy Cities page, and that will actually take you to uh, PRC, our partner, Phoenix Revitalization Corporation. And it'll take you to their website. It's just we have a short link that makes it easy to, to share with folks where to go. Um, I am gonna be updating that in the next couple of weeks. So right now, um, I would say sit tight, but uh, if you go to our website, um, you, can, um, you can apply there. Okay, great, thank you. And this question is for Amy from Trees Matter. Um, I know that you were saying that you have your arborist on call and I probably just messed up what that title is. Um, for these big tree plantings that you're doing at, uh, let's say, Padilla, um, do you offer ongoing maintenance uh, help or how are you ensuring that those trees make it to a healthy age? Yeah, so right now we work with um, typically like maintenance and custodial staff at the schools. Um, we're doing uh, some classes um in the fall for maintenance and custodial um, services to attend and and learn best management practices our goal is um with schools is for for them to become you know engaged in the process of tree care um, and to have as many different communities that are interacting with the trees at the schools be engaged um, because we're such a small staff we can't be the tree care um, for the schools, but we do inventory the trees for the first years, um, first, I think four years, twice a year. So we want to make sure that we can see how the trees are doing, what the failure rate is, um, what, why there's a success rate, you know, is it just because there's a bad summer, is it watering, you know, those sorts of things. So we're learning as we go about that, but we have, you know, replanted trees at schools where the trees have not done well as long as we can identify the problem and and make sure it doesn't 
excellent, continue to be, you know, a chronic issue. So our goal is, you know, to basically use a, a collection of, of ways to address the ongoing tree care maintenance support. Um, so that way these trees are successful, whether, you know, trees matter is the one that's making sure it happens or, or the school themselves. So um, yeah, that stakeholder engagement is really important to us. Critical. So when people are thinking about a tree planting program, they also need to be thinking about a tree maintenance program too. I think that's really important to link. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I did see you just mentioned the Urban Forestry Roundtable, which um, a lot of us are a part of, and, and that's um, being led by the Arizona Sustainability Alliance, um, the American Forest and City of Phoenix. And there's a lot of really great stakeholder and, and a collection of a lot of different special specialization of, of groups, whether it's through our, you know, departments, different health departments, our, um, you know, arborists, our forestry departments, our city um, sustainability departments. Um, so there's a lot of different groups working together and we've identified three major areas that we want to, projects that we want to focus on that could be huge in changing the way that we think about trees. And, and one is um, creating a citizen forester program that's, um, that, that may even be statewide at some point, but it would be right now regional and it's focused on getting people engaged and learning about how to, to do the basics of um, tree planting and tree care. And then that being a database for all our organizations and groups to take these individuals instead of them having to learn every individual's organization and cities groups. And then um, there's the cool corridors that City of Phoenix is doing, as well as um, kind of an HOA group um, that's working on a, another kind of engaging program. So. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, that's a really interesting collaboration. And if somebody wanted to find out more information about it, can you put the link in the chat? Um, I don't know if there is a website, but they're more than welcome to email me and I can get them okay. connected in the group. I'll put my email in the website or in the chat. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So thank you so much for this last round of lightning panel members. Uh, we're going to go to a break. Um, we are going to take, uh, we are going to break until 1050 AM. And uh, after that, Dave Pandula is going to resume with the final panel. So please um, check in in a couple of minutes and this program is going to resume at 1050. Thank you. Okay, it is 1050 and welcome back everyone as we move into the final third of the program. Thanks to our lightning round presenters for an incredible set of highlights, of having visions of the tree planting in front of the cooling center with the cool pavement in front of it with trained leaders from Anna's program, LAD's team on site, ensuring that conditions are, are heat. So we can imagine all of these projects coming together in a, a very nice way. We're gonna transition now to think about federal infrastructure investment, how to align our heat work with some possibilities coming down the road. And uh, we don't have the time to go into all of the details of the proposed plan from the administration, but there is a link to it in the chat. And I'll, uh, I'll just open the discussion by highlighting that there are components of the infrastructure plan that seemingly could be heat related and then maybe others that could be heat related with a little bit of creativity on our part. And as, uh, as we're well aware from following the news, the exact plan and the funding support for it is very much still a fluid conversation. We're really appreciative to have some uh, local to national leaders with us uh, on the line who are gonna help us think through some of these connections from the office of our senior senator, Kirsten Cinnamon, we have Inder Gunala, who's been on the line listening to all of the good work happening, and hopefully we'll be reporting in to the, the senator. We have Ronan Levinson, who's the lead of the Urban Heat Island Group at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is affiliated with the Department of Energy, and Braden Kay from the city of Tempe. Uh, of, of course, as is always the case, there are depends on the schedules of our elected officials in unpredictable and evolving ways. And we have, uh, uh, Inder is only with us for a few more minutes. So I wanted to, uh, Inder, go to you first, if we could, to open the discussion. And thank you for participating. Matt, we can probably cut this call. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for participating. And we hope you've enjoyed the, the conversation thus far. Uh, and Inder, um, maybe you could just open with a brief introduction to you and some early reaction to what you've heard today. Sure, thanks, David. And thank you, everyone, for just all the these presentations and the feedback. I mean, this is how 
you know, I think officials make better decisions. A uh, little introduction to myself. My name is Inner Ganala. I'm Center Cinema's Outreach Coordinator. I focus on intergov business engagement and economic development relationships, among, among some other things. Um, and I just quickly wanted to say, you know, thank you again to our first responders, our emergency preparedness workers, nurses, and anyone else on this call uh, that's working in public service. I've, I've gotten to work with many, uh, many of you, I think, over the last year, and it certainly takes all of us. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Inder, let me throw a question to you, and then we'll uh, introduce our, our other speakers here. And uh, as has been the case for the whole meeting, please add your questions and comments in the chat. I imagine this will transition into more of a, a fluid conversation. But uh, Inder, recognizing that the, the infrastructure plan is very much still in flux, what, what can you share with us? Yeah, I mean, in your mind, how do these dots connect? The work you've heard on heat and what might be possible from infrastructure. What are the obvious connections? And you know, maybe there's some less obvious connections we should be thinking about. Yeah, no, absolutely, David. And I think, um, you know, generally, it's it's being creative about the way we make gas, right? I feel like that's always kind of where we are with the federal government and where we are with these proposals. Uh, but you're right, the situation remains fluid and, and the discussions around what's specifically in the package um, you know, are really are really still up for debate and discussion. So I think going forward, it's it's really just being aware of where folks' priorities, you know, are. Um, for, for our local communities on this call, you know, this, this might seem obvious, but you know, my best advice is to be organized, you know, in your proposals. Um, you know, uh, complete any impact or feedback studies that you still have going on. And when you make asks, and this seems again pretty obvious, making tangible asks, right? Whether it's direct funding amounts, uh, language requests, uh, you know, instructions from how from the federal government on as to how these funds should be going, being spent. If it's a bigger project, which a lot of these do sound like really big projects uh, or long-term projects, make incremental asks, right? I, but the big thing is don't miss the boat. If there is a package coming up, um, make those asks that you think you can make and that will work. Um, and I will say in terms of presenting the information and, and, and trying to get your your priorities to be the top priorities of your elected officials when they're making these, um, when they're, they're discussing these packages, is to try to consolidate information to digestible forms where possible. So these presentations are great, uh, but you know, one thing I know a lot of folks love are one pagers or anywhere where we can get that consolidate, consolidate information in one page where we can ask secondary questions and, and where you guys can kind of rely on the background knowledge you have, whether, you know, kind of in the weeds is, is something that makes a lot of sense. You don't have to be able to do, you need to do that right off the bat, um, sir, but you know, certainly know your data and know your pitch, uh, but, but we're, we're always happy to, I think, hear top line and then, and then kind of dig in further if we need to. Um, and just, and David, I know just quickly, you know, I have to, I have to pop off here. I apologize again to folks. A um, lot, a lot of great information. <laughs> we know these calls run, 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 run long, excuse me. Um, some other motivations I think to look for in the packages to, you know, uh, policy areas or, or proposals. I think health's a big one, right? There's always a desire to improve health access and equity, always. It's a big, been a big priority of this administration. It's certainly a big priority of our office. Um, you know, in this context, here, really, deaths are always preventable. Um, and they can happen to anyone just in the wrong situation that lack the resources. So finding ways to make direct impact there, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. Arizona's wanna see government dollars get spent logically, right? And so anywhere where we can easily show direct impact, um, that's an easy bipartisan sell. And so, you know, I'll use this example from some of the data we shared earlier. If it's folks with mental health disorders or folks engaging in particular activities, uh, you know, or whoever that is, right? Ensuring that people, you know, People are met where their where their needs are, whether that's education, uh, more cooling centers, or 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 maybe even bringing those resources directly into communities where transportation or or access might be hard. Otherwise, is you know again a great example. Um, so I guess yeah, homes, residential, you know, policy areas, energy and utilities, and then good community planning, maybe around like parks, shade. Again, programs that connect people closer seem very direct impact. Um, and then I will say, you know, the last thing here, it's 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 hard I think for for folks. To have their shovel ready project list set out, it's it's shovel ready is a great term that I think a lot of people are like, oh man, I hate I hate hearing that because I have so much to share. Um, but shovel ready lists are, are are important. I think the big part of that is if you're worried about community outreach or ensuring that there's good community outreach in those plans before you submit them. Uh, there are so many ways to connect with folks these days. I think one you know for all the bad things that happened throughout the pandemic, at least one good thing is that you know, we've gotten folks more comfortable with Zoom. And where internet access is possible, where teleconferencing is possible, it's a great way to bring folks. And the only thing with that is ensuring that um, it's well publicized, it's accessible, to ensure that that data you're getting and that feedback you're getting is accurate. Um, but I'll say outside of that, uh, we always think, well, yeah, it's our, it's our position in our office to really understand that I'm in conversation with local electeds all the time. 
you know, local gov folks really understand their communities well. Um, but if you remain uncertain, um, you know, I would say disseminate a list of priorities either through local media or through your official channels and, and genuinely ask for that public feedback. I think that's a really good way to still get public feedback uh, in, a, in a relatively quick amount of time uh, while we're still kind of facing deadlines. But I think I will, I will leave it at that. Uh, and David, I'll drop my contact information in the chat below for everybody. I apologize, I can't stay for the last Yeah, no, Indir, thank you so yeah. much. My, my chat has been uh, blowing up here with folks saying, thank you, thank you. This information is so specific and tangible and helpful. So thank you for that. Okay. And okay, uh, it's, it's my understanding that Indir has some sort of written responses to questions we had as well, but we really appreciate you listening. Uh, participating in the meeting and certainly more conversations to come with uh, with your office. Thank you. Thank you so, Thank you so much. All right. And let's uh, transition forward and meet our other uh, panelists. We're so thankful to have Ronan Levinson with us from, uh, from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, Ronan is a very prominent figure in the heat research community. He's the leader of the Heat Island Group there at LBNL. Lots of academic publications, often focused on cool building materials. Uh, I didn't know this until recently, but he won the 2016 uh, R&D 100 award for something called the invention of something called the cool roof time machine. So maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. But Ronan, uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Maybe you could just introduce uh, this really diverse audience to what your office does to get us started. Absolutely. Good morning. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Terrific. All right. Well, thanks. So as uh, Dave said, I lead the Heat Island Group here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We look at ways of making uh, people, vehicles, buildings cooler in hot places, and Arizona certainly qualifies. Uh, just FYI, um, David Saylor, David Hondula's colleague, is my predecessor at the lab. He was the one who finished his PhD when I started my PhD about, I don't know, 30 years ago or so. So, uh, Traditionally, we've looked at ways of mitigating what's called the urban heat island. That's the elevation of the air temperature in the city over that outside the city. But many of the measures that we have used to make the outside air cooler, such as reflective roofs um, or adding shade trees, just as the two most common examples, also work nicely for making a building without air conditioning cooler. So over the last few years, we've started a new initiative called Cool Building Solutions that seeks to use all sorts of passive or low energy cooling technologies. Low energy meaning something like a fan that could be run without grid power in order to make buildings that don't have air conditioning um, more comfortable and safer in hot weather. And we've lots of other things going on, but that's a quick introduction. Great, thanks so much, Ronan. And uh, Braden, if we could go to you as well for a brief introduction, since I think you'll be jumping in the conversation over the next couple of questions. Uh, our colleague Braden Kay in the city of Tempe is absolutely one of our, you know, when, when Indra talks about the local leadership on heat, I think Braden is uh, one of the model cases for that. Braden, thank you for joining us. Maybe just a brief introduction to yourself and, and some of Tempe's uh, work in this area. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so yeah, Braden Kay, Sustainability Director, City of Tempe. Uh, we passed our first climate action plan uh, in 2019. It was the second climate action plan uh, in, in the state after we had three sections of that plan, two for decarbonization, energy and transportation, and we decided to do one resilience topic and that's extreme heat. So uh, we've been advancing our urban forestry program. We've hired a new emergency manager who's been working with us on extreme heat. And we've been um, approaching green building codes and uh, green infrastructure standards as other key areas that we need to be changing in order to prepare our built environment for the coming heat. So uh, thanks everyone for every, everything that everyone on, on this call is doing uh, to advance our, our resilience to extreme heat efforts and happy to be here today. So, as you can see, we're approaching this conversation from many directions, federal elected, federal staff, local staff as well. And there are many other elected uh, officials and their representatives and staff members on the line. So if any of them wish to weigh in or really anybody else over the remainder of the conversation, please uh, don't be shy to, to do so. Uh, Ronan, I wanted to, to go to you next uh, because, you know, because you're connected to the Department of Energy, you may have at least heard some whispers in the wind about you know, what, what the infrastructure package may look like, and you know, maybe your team has been thinking a little bit about how to be prepared for it. I don't know how much of that you can share in this public setting, but, but what maybe an opening question would be, what advice would you have for cities, nonprofits, and others who are trying to become ready 
for this in, uh, this possible investment and maybe aligning with work that your group does? Sure. First thing, I have no inside information on what is or will be in the infrastructure package. I just read the newspapers like everybody else. So first off there. But uh, you know, we are, of course, anticipating there may be some uh, work uh, related to making buildings better. Our area tends to focus largely on buildings um, that's contained in the infrastructure package. And we're largely taking our guidance from what we've seen in the Biden climate package, which was uh, pushing to make our cities and buildings more resilient to a number of natural hazards, including extreme heat. So on my end, for example, I've been pitching to the um, Department of Energy, the idea to start thinking about not just the energy savings and the peak power demand reduction that one can attain with cooling technologies, but to also think about how cooling strategies that we use perform in buildings when you don't have power. What I've noticed is that if you look at the progress made in building energy efficiency since before building codes were enacted around 1980, we've made steady improvements in reducing the energy that's needed to keep a building comfortable over the course of the year. But if I then look at how a modern building performs when you have a blackout, and I compare that to how a pre-1980 building performs without a blackout, I see the modern buildings aren't really that much better. In fact, sometimes they're worse. So um, I am trying to get the Department of Energy more interested in the idea of thinking about the non-energy consequences of its decisions regarding energy efficiency standards. And I would definitely encourage anybody who has a, a project in mind, a way that they can uh, make the world better by addressing extreme heat, to in fact try to have have something ready in the short term um, proposed work. Um, this is just from experience with um, Ara back in 2009 or so, that there was a, a real pressure to try to do things that would have an immediate benefit. So if there are things that you think could be started in the course of the next six months, that would be great. I would also say, though, if you have longer term activities, those are worthwhile, too, because not everything is going to happen immediately. So this is pretty generic, but bear in mind, I don't actually have a crystal ball or an inside line. Yeah, thanks, Ron. And you mentioned that the climate plan uh, language it has some language around buildings. I'm also looking at the statement on the what's called the American Jobs Plan, which I think is kind of the other half of the infrastructure. And there is a high level item that says build, preserve and retrofit more than 2 million homes and commercial buildings, modernize nation schools and child care facilities, upgrade veteran hospitals and federal buildings. So that, that language also seems to really resonate uh, with what you're suggesting. There was a comment in the chat earlier, just thinking about these projects that could be ready to go. Um, Melissa, correct me if I have the statistic wrong, but there was a comment in the chat that something like 90% of the cooling centers here in Maricopa County do not have backup power at least we don't know that they have backup power and you were talking a lot about passive strategies and performance of buildings in low or no power scenarios i i wonder what your thoughts might be on an opportunity to look at at those buildings as part of our protective infrastructure you know i oh sorry. yeah go ahead melissa yeah I think I'd like to add that 90% of these buildings are serving as emergency centers, and but they also uh, are, they have other functions as well. So yeah, Dave, I like that comment. Go ahead, Ron. Oh, sure. I was just going to, uh, to mention that we have an ongoing project uh, funded by the state of California to do work in Fresno to look at ways of making um, underserved communities in Fresno more resilient to extreme heat. Well, there, there are many aspects to it. I won't dive too deep into it right now, but I will mention that one thing that we uh, learned was uh, cooling centers were part of the original plan, although we had found that through speaking to the people in the community, that cooling centers were really not the first choice of anybody for where to go in um, really hot weather. And I was wondering what the experience was in your part of the country. Yeah, M Melissa, would you like to weigh in on that? And you know, maybe we could hear from Alicia and, and some others who are really working firsthand in cooling centers. But Melissa, let's go to you first, and then you can bounce the ball forward. Sure. I think that that's one of uh, many questions that we have about cooling centers here, because it's my inclination that, first of all, we have an awareness problem about cooling centers where they are, who can go, who is welcome, who is not welcome, is there a stigma? 
And um, we're hoping to overcome some of that, those questions this summer by doing monthly surveys and then doing a point in time survey for people who are using cooling centers. But I will uh, pass the, the ball to Alicia or anyone else um, from the Salvation Army. Maybe they can better answer that question. And Alicia, I think you're muted. Although we can see you. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, so we're sorry, I was sort of on another call. Um, as far as just curious about the population that's coming or what the sort of outreach looks like. And, and you know, how you, know, you saw the visitorship to the cooling center last year. For how many folks was the cooling center first choice as a place of respite mm -hmm. or yeah. maybe a measure of last resort? Right. We definitely got to a point where there was a population where it was first choice. They were here every single day. They knew about it. They told their friends. Uh, they were all uh, varying levels of uh, experiencing homelessness. And it was a place for them to come and be able to hang out, charge their devices, and, you know, sort of seek some assistance, like I mentioned earlier. We did have, unfortunately, only on, on one occasion that I can recall, a family that came in because their air conditioner had broke. And they were in the neighborhood they had seen the signs she showed up with her children and they hung out while the repairs were being done um, in there because they were renters and so you know we were encouraged by that because that's really we're here for everybody so um, we you know definitely served the lower income population um, and those experiencing homelessness primarily um, <clears throat> and it really did you know sort of just become a place to hang so Nicole did you have another perspective to share on that uh, question oh. Can you? Yes, we got you. Uh, so we had a lot of homeless people um, that would stop by our cooling centers. They'd come in, charge things up. Um, you know, it's just kind of word of mouth on the street. They all know where we're located in the neighborhoods, um, you know, across Phoenix. Um, I'd say that's the majority of people that we got. Um, occasionally be a family that was stopping by for um, food boxes or something, and maybe their, their air conditioning wasn't working in their car. So they'd come in and sit for a bit. and. You know, we have the TVs on or there's stuff going on, so they'll hang out for a bit. Um, that's the the type of clientele we'd see. Um, I was going to talk about the generators really quick. I asked um, our organization where ours were. <laughs> Apparently, we have one mobile one that can power up an entire building. So in the event of, you know, one or two going out for whatever reasons, we can move it around. Um, but that's all we have. But someone did tell me that uh, AZ DEMA has generators that they can lend out. I don't know what the qualifications are to get those, but that's something someone could look into. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And I think the fact that you know you, you as a immediate service provider have questions about that process suggests we have some dots to connect. So, Ronan, what is your reaction to hearing that? You know, that and the thoughts on you know sort of orienting cooling centers toward passive technologies, uh, backup power, and so on. Sure. So, you know, one thing that I was hearing is that. The primary users of the cooling facilities in your area um, are um, otherwise homeless people. When we were trying to see whether people who do have homes were interested in using cooling centers as a refuge um, with, during heat waves without power, uh, we found that most of them weren't very attracted to the proposition um, because either they were concerned about who else was at the cooling centers um, or because there wasn't really anything for them to do there. Um, in fact, there was one cooling center that also had some basketball games in the same building, and that was more um, attractive just because people were there to play basketball. But that's the little bit that I know. Um, but uh, I will say the following, for any kind of building, whether it's a cooling center or a home, I recognize that in really hot weather, passive cooling measures are not going to do the job by themselves, because if it's 100 Fahrenheit outside, it's not going to be especially cool inside your building. Um, what I am hoping, though, is that for these really hot places, the passive cooling measures will allow the um, backup power um, to do more. Um, in other words, if you can rely on the grid to run your air conditioner, you're set. If you're dealing with uh, brownouts, blackouts, or here in California, we have these uh, called public safety power shutoffs where they turn off the grill fires and that can last you know, a week. Um, when you're trying to deal with alternative power sources, you want to keep the load on your equipment as low as possible um, because you only have so much power to work with. 
And there, I think that the uh, passive cooling measures could be really helpful because it will increase the number of hours in which you can keep your building um, cool, comfortable, and safe. And based on your expert reading of the newspapers without any uh, inside information, uh, I'm getting the impression from you that this this conversation could fit very nicely in the conversation around the infrastructure plan. Am, am I gauging your impression correctly? Yes, as, as a newspaper reader, I would say that. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite Braden to, um, one, respond to what we've heard thus far, and then Braden and Tempe have been doing some really important work building our pipeline to the federal uh, to the federal government with another tool in the toolbox that has been really underutilized by our heat community. So Braden, first, would love to hear your thoughts about cooling centers and passive uh, passive technologies and how that all might fit in. And then, um, then I know you wanted to share a little bit with us about some, some other steps in hazard planning. Yes, thanks, Dave. So yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things, cooling centers and then the concept of resilience hubs, which is this growing concept that of a community-centered uh, place that could be in every neighborhood that has re resilient energy components, but also uh, can service the community during normal times as well as during extreme heat times, that cooling centers and resilient hubs do offer this opportunity to be places for building experimentation, where we, you know, should be looking at a variety of different, uh, you know, cooling uh, technologies and whether they're, they're passive or active, uh, and that we we really have an opportunity to partner with architects, landscape architects, you know, uh, you know, building sciences on what what these types of buildings uh, should include, and, and uh, to put put it back to to the first presentation, we need to be finding funding opportunities for those types of building uh, experiments and for those types of uh, cooling center and resilient hub experiments. So one thing that I, I I was really taken by um, was this call for shovel ready projects, you know, um, from cinema's office. And I, I definitely agree with that. And so there, there's two kind of points that, that I wanna make. And so one is, is that cities uh, and, and their partners, their partners have an ability to go to a city being like, we want these practices. Um, you know, there's a real opportunity for plan integration. And so we have some plan integration <laughs> experts uh, among us today. Uh, and, and I think that there is, you know, one of the things that we're thinking quite a bit about is how do we make sure that we're taking all sorts of different plans and making sure they integrate. Another key piece is there is one particular plan that has the potential to be our local love letter to the federal government. And that's the all hazard mitigation plan. And so one thing that I just want to have people on people's radar is there's an opportunity to participate in your county's all hazard mitigation plan. It usually every jurisdiction within a county submits their particular plan. It includes a community description, a risk assessment, mitigation strategies, and, and how you maintain your plan. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is, you know, you need your municipal utilities on board. They need to bring that kind of resilience and emergency preparedness lens. And they're bringing in their long-term asset management plans, their integrated energy plans. There's all sorts of asset plans that, that need to be integrated into the all hazard plan. You then have city plans like Tempe's climate action plan, for instance, human services plans, uh, the general plan from community development. There's a lot of opportunities to make sure that emergency preparedness is in, and heat are embedded in those plans. Uh, and then we have, uh, we've been seeing a lot of urban forestry master plans and a lot of parks master plans. Actually, our parks master plan is coming out and they've done an incredible job. There's four tenants of that plan, one of them sustainability and one of them's resilience. And they've been, our parks department about how they play a role in resilience to extreme heat. That's been very exciting. This is then all put into our emergency management work. And so now that we have a new emergency manager in Tempe, they're really taking on this plan integration and making sure that we're considering these things. So now I want to give you a sense of what we did in terms of incorporating heat into our all hazard mitigation plan. And a lot of folks here, including Dave Hondula, Melissa Guerrero, Liza Kurtz, and, and others helped us formulate new actions. So in the 2015 plan, there were two main actions for heat in the all hazard mitigation plan, meaning that there were two things that we could ask 
the FEMA for it, uh, for heat mitigation, education and water bottles. So we decided that those two things were insufficient. And so we came up with about 40 actions that we believe we could be taking in the next five years to become more resilient to extreme heat. So we have one bucket that's really around coordination, education, and training. So training for staff, uh, making sure that our CERT program is oriented towards heat, coordinating with faith-based organizations, uh, more public education, training for residents. So a whole variety of coordination and educational training opportunities. And, and Brandon, and, just to interrupt for a moment, I do see a nice connection to Ronan's group and others working on buildings there in number 13, training on weatherization and energy savings. It feels like there's a nice, you know, a nice potential overlap there. <laughs> Absolutely. And so a huge opportunity for figuring out how, how should we be talking to renters? How should we be talking to, to homeowners? What are the opportunities for energy savings? What are, what are the opportunities for, for weatherization? Uh, the city of Tempe has hired Unlimited Potential, uh, a local nonprofit, to do door-to-door -door work on uh, training on how do you read your energy bill? What are opportunities for energy cost savings? They're doing this uh, in the Promodoro model bilingually. Um, so, and we're encouraging other cities to follow suit. I think that there's a huge opportunity to increase our engagement um, in frontline communities. I'm very excited about the work that TNC and others are doing with the ambassador program, but I also think that cities and utilities need to be a lot, doing a lot more of that uh, training as well. Um, I won't get into this in a huge way, but there's a lot more sort of regional collaboration that's needed. Uh, we're working on more regional resilience collaboration amongst the county and cities here uh, in Maricopa County. Uh, we just recently received a grant where we'd be creating two youth councils uh, in specific neighborhoods in Tempe to advance urban cooling. Um, and I think the long haul goal for us and what we've told FEMA our long haul goal is, we need a regional cooling utility. We need some way of raising money as a region to pay for urban forestry, cool materials, green infrastructure across Maricopa County, whether that's through a bond or a sales tax. Um, all of our work that we're doing needs to lead towards some type of long-term solution to resilience to extreme heat in our county. And that's gonna require uh, a major investment. And we put that in the plan as something that we wanna be striving towards. Um, there's also an, a, a huge opportunity for codes and standards. So urban forestry master plan, a heat relief plan, uh, more work um, in terms of specific infrastructure throughout the city. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I think that we need to be advancing both green infrastructure standards like Tucson has and green building codes like Scottsdale has. There's a lot of uh, uh, cooling uh, mitigation opportunities in those codes. Um, and then you see down here at the bottom, I definitely have, we definitely need to continue to invest in research. So the work that, that, that uh, Ronan is doing, the work that David Saylors and many ASU folks are doing, uh, and that we heard just from uh, Jenny and Ariane, really important work. And then lastly, there's the built environment itself. So all the built environment, including cooling centers, um, uh, including microgrids, uh, this idea of cool islands, uh, transit shelter, streetscape investments, huge fan of the work that Phoenix and ASU are doing on cool corridors. I think that this streetscape line is basically an homage to that, uh, as well as uh, additional building retrofits, as we heard from Ronan, and then further investment in green infrastructure uh, pilot projects. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of what a city can do. And the great thing about this is that this is now something that's available. Now, I've, we've written this love letter to the county. The county is making the state aware of that. And then this is sitting on FEMA's books. And that way, when opportunities come along, like an infrastructure package, we've already articulated a wide variety of investments that we're ready to make or wanting to make. And we don't have to go searching for them. They're sitting here on the books, ready to be invested in. Thanks for the time. Yeah, Braden, so uh, so impressive, and thanks for sharing. And I, well, I even like the detail there about uh, lighting along Tempe Town Lake, which can be conceived as a, as a heat intervention, making a safe spacer during a cooler time of the day. So very very clever. Uh, Ronan certainly would welcome your reaction. Anything we heard from Braden, we've also received a question that I think is for you in the chat from Janice. 
Uh, Janice asked, to what extent have utility peak load capacity and heat wave projections been compared to uh, utility resilience strategies and community re readiness? That feels like a really broad question that we might organize a whole research institution around, but maybe you have a, maybe you have at least an insight into a part of the question there. And Janice, if you'd like to clarify uh, or elaborate, feel free. But Ronan, take a, take a stab at that. You know, I, I like uh, Dave, like you said, I think it's a great question and it's probably a gigantic topic unto itself. Here at Berkeley Lab, we have a whole um, demand side management team um, under Marianne Piet, my division director, um, that's been looking at ways to um, try to handle the uh, inadequacy right now of our power supply on really hot days. And part of the work that's being done across the lab is to look at future weather. Um, well, actually look at current weather in heat waves and uh, future weather and future weather in heat waves. So we're sort of, we're on this. It's a little bit tricky because, you know, what's the old saying? Uh, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But I would say that as we've been looking at the strategies that are available right now um, in communities, we have been considering um, both typical weather and heat wave conditions. And in later work, I think we're going to focus more on projections, what would be happening 10, 20, 50 years from now as we deal with climate change on top of heat waves. But quite frankly, I think the question that was raised here is a wonderful opportunity for the folks who try to deal with management of peak demand and those who try to manage concerns related to heat resilience um, to get together to understand what's going to happen when it's extraordinarily hot um, and we do not have sufficient power to keep air conditioning running. I'm sorry, Great. I couldn't be more explicit answer. Basically, what we've asked is a gigantic research question. Uh, Janice, you might have motivated uh, you know, 10 years of uh, work here at, at ASU and uh, U of A and, and our other partner institutions around the state. Ronan, if I could ask one more question that will transition into uh, uh, our recap here. Yeah, even when we introduced you, you were the lead of the Urban Heat Island Group. We talk a lot about heat as an urban issue. And we imagine the, the equity context around heat in cities. We have a lot of participants on the call who represent more rural parts of Arizona, uh, and there are clear equity issues between urban and rural settings. So what, what thoughts can you share with us about how the type of work your lab is doing and, and thinking about are applicable in the, in the rural setting or even in the suburban areas? Sure. You know, while we're called the Urban Heat Island Group, the origin of that is because the urban heat island effect is something that is most prominent in dense urban areas. But the things that lead to unwanted heating, either of the outside air or inside a building, that happens no matter where you are. It just happens to be a little bit more intense in city um, centers. If you are in a rural area or in the suburbs, then you have the same challenges with your building envelope um, getting too hot in the sun. Uh, you have the same problem with uh, pavements. In the rural area, you probably are benefiting more from having uh, lots of vegetation, um, which is a helpful cooling measure as long as you have enough water to you know, keep the evaporation going. Um, but I would say that all the sorts of strategies that we are looking at in order to make cities cool, really the first thing that they do is they make buildings cool. And whether you are in the countryside or you're in the suburbs or you're in the city, you're probably luck living in a building. Great. Well, Ronan, uh, thank you so much for being here. Hopefully today is a good introduction uh, for you to this group and for this group to you. I know you know some of the folks already, but hopefully an introduction to a much wider audience today. We have three minutes left, and I wanted to ask some of the uh, co-organizers just to give a brief final word or reaction, maybe 10 or 15 seconds, a useful nugget that you've learned, or maybe some uh, some inspiration to take us forward. And Braden, I always know you love being put on the spot first. Uh, so just any any closing thoughts from you? Uh, just that it's so important that we stay involved. I really appreciate what I saw in the chat in terms of the Tohono O'odham uh, Nation having a climate adaptation plan. Uh, I did not know that. Um, using venues like this to make sure we're sharing best practices, we're sharing plans, we're sharing the latest research is so important. 
Uh, so if you have plans or things that you think this rest of this community should see, please email Dave. We are working on having a variety of, of repositories for this type of information and for sharing. Uh, it is so important that we share information and we share practices in this work. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Braden. Paul, any final uh, comments from you? Any changes to the weather forecast since we heard from you two hours ago? No changes, you know, and just thinking about a takeaway, I, I've worked at the weather office here for 15 years and it's uh, unfortunate to see the trends that continue. So hopefully we can all continue to do good work and, and get this thing reversed. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Matt, let's go to the health department for a final perspective. So I think uh, 2021, we're hoping for a better year. And I think in terms of just planning, and getting the conversation and dialogue started this year, I think we'll be in a better position to reduce the impact of heat-related illness and deaths. Thanks, Matt. The, the last thing I will say is that there are two upcoming meetings that may be of interest to you. Well, I'm sure there are more than two, but at least, uh, at least two that we'll promote here. Uh, one is that the Sustainable Cities Network through ASU with Tempe and others is, uh, in fact, convening a discussion at noon today on hazard mitigation planning and lessons learned. Braden, if there's a link or a way for folks to join that you could add to the chat, please do so. Uh, and then the 18th Annual Climate Prediction Application Science Workshop, which is free to participate and will discuss uh, emerging trends in climate science that can help inform our conversation starts tomorrow online. And with that, I will thank you all for participating and give my colleague, Melissa Gordaro, the final word. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Um, I hope that you learned something and that you have some information that you can bring back to your organization and some information that you can bring forward to new people because really in order for all of us to be effective in managing heat, we all have to work together and be transparent and work uh, so that we're not fighting against each other, but rather amplifying our work. So um, please continue to reach out to each other and uh, let's, let's get this heat problem solved. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ronan, so much, and Braden and all the other speakers. Greatly appreciated.